your uh, object user yes sir uh, your objective is uh, you know with uh, cultivated crop plants yes, mine yes. is you know all uh -huh. wild plants which yes. today we don't know what is their significance but tomorrow they may be of some use so i keep on working the on plants which are neglected by all yes sir <laughs> <laughs> ah yes sir still sir there is a gap of uh, rt of this crop wild rotus sir ha ah, yeah there is yes, a, i i was uh, preparing this lecture yes, and then uh, whatever pamphlets we have published mm -hmm. uh, yes. and then i compared with modern literature there yes. are number of mistakes mm -hmm. which need to be uh, i mean uh, studied and confirmed Yes. there are number of thing that databases which have which are available they yes. are not up to the date and yes. whatever they have they have loaded but mm -hmm. there are lot of uh, mistakes in that databases yes. even including these plants online okay mm -hmm. yes sir. Uh, what the plants online that also needs lot of changes which i will be sharing with our uh, participants ah yes sir because uh, i cannot do everything Okay, yes, yes. I have my own own uh, agenda. So mm -hmm. these new boys and uh, researchers can take up uh, yes, those things as a lifelong work and contribute significantly in, uh, especially mm -hmm. uh, wild relatives of cultivated plants. Of yes, course, sir. it is uh, you know it was a really you gave me difficult task. <laughs> yes, sir. So no, sir. Actually, it is. I do not work with crop plants. I work uh, with. while the plants ano uh, sir ever uh, monumental work uh, that is vigna really wonderful work sir that is ah uh, uh, that is a laid foundation yes. for our workers and now four five new species have come yes sir right so ah uh, uh, that is ah uh, uh, foundation uh, if people student get they do further work so that yes. way it goes yes ah well. uh, dr subhash ah uh, Uh, time you say nine forty three. Shall we start? Ah, uh, I think uh, uh, should we start? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, participant will join, na? Ah, yes. Because yes. today is Saturday, so. <laughs> my, uh, yes. Uh, Saturday and also this one actually. So today uh, second Saturday, na? Yes, yes. yes Most yes. of their uh, their holy holiday. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, sir. Uh, let me start sir ah uh, yeah uh, please go ahead uh please uh, dear participants very well good morning and uh, let me introduce our current speaker uh dr professor shrirang ramprasad yadav currently she, he is working as a insa senior scientist in sivaji university kolhapur and he is a master degree and phd from uh, mumbai university mumbai and after that he joined as a head reader and head in delhi university as a professor and after that he is a professor continuously he worked uh, since 2005 to 2016 and he is a, while we are seeing his achievements he is a brilliant and outstanding scientist and he worked more than 40 years uh, in the field of taxonomy and he completed 20 projects as a key role in the development of lead botanic garden of botany shivaji university and he described over 78 species of flowering plants which are new to science and revised some of genera for the state or uh, country and he engaged in plant exploration in western ghats biostatistics and conservation of rare plants and mainly he worked in eponotics and uh, bulbous monocots and on behalf of him his students also given a name on a, as a honor that is a 13 new species honored his name and very famous sir vigna yadavai mukuna yadavai and protalaria shrirangiana and uh, uh, in a plant taxonomy as you are aware species is also one form but coming genus is very difficult in a, one new genus is also described on his in honor that is uh, shrirangia concordensis actually by his students in march 20 uh, 2022 and he is a recipient of lot of awards and recognitions that is indian association of angiosperm taxonomy national academy of science and maharashtra academy of science national academy new delhi 
as he is a fellow of uh, all the societies and he is a recipient of more awards also there but here i could not mention any other thing and uh, beside all these uh, things he is the best teacher uh, and last year participants also requested sir please can you arrange another lecture like that then we call sir and uh, even though he is very busy in spite of his busy and uh, he accepted our invitation and sir thank you very much uh, as you are accepted our invitation and he published more than uh, 300 research papers and eight books flora of kolhapur district and grass genera of maharashtra and flowering plants of western ghats even he it is a very monumental work that is on a key illustrative guide of genus abalmuscus genus cucumis and genus bigna it is really very well versed monumental work published by in collaboration with nbpgr and uh, yadav sir it is a combined natp project and uh, it is really beautiful work sir that is and it is very easy guide for our uh, all cultivated uh, explorers this is regarding cwr sir on behalf of organizing committee and uh, all other team members i am inviting you sir please kindly share your knowledge and expertise and uh, mentioned about the keys and how it will be useful in uh, describing cwr and other species thank you sir uh, please uh, sir now over to sir welcome sir welcome uh, thank you dr ravi for a nice introduction in uh, this good mo- i mean morning and uh, now i will go directly to my presentation okay. so first of all i must uh, park i mean uh, Uh, ah, it is visible, sir. It is nice. Visible. Uh, you are. I am audible also, na? No? Yes, sir. Ah. Yes, uh. First thing, most important thing which I want to uh, share with our NBPGRI is that that National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources is an important institute of our country conserving germplasm of crop plants, and therefore every scientist. is deeply concerned with wild relatives of cultivated plants because a global problem food security which they are going they how to answer or they how to provide solutions to the problems in coming years and that way uh, nbpjara has a great role to play for betterment of human society and crop production i am thankful to dr ganendra singh director nbpgri for inviting me to deliver this lecture and uh, a lecture on wild crop relatives a key to the genetic enrichment it is a very vast topic there are more than 300 cultivated plants uh, crops and talking about really wild relatives of these all plants is not possible for anyone it is a huge topic but i will restrict myself to three genera which uh, and i have worked with the nbpjri in collaboration and those are three genera abal moscus cucumis and bigna so these are important uh, crops and uh, where whatever i have studied little in my life i will try to share with and uh, uh, uh those who are there i mean many must be young people young boys young researchers they can take this problem as a lifelong t- problem and that too with passion passion if you develop passion for vigna or passion for cucumis passion for abal moscus i am sure you will be world known scientist of the uh, uh, of the era because these are very important and you know kakdi then musk melon then our bhindi uh, ladies finger you know uh, every if you go to pune every dabba in the uh, lunch time there will be bhindi in that you know so it is so important crop and we have some problems with these crops and wild relatives will come to our help in improving them so that way this is a very important uh, 
aspect which I wanted to say about uh, this one and role of NBPJRA is a great role. They have to play a great role. Uh, you know, we have databases. In the beginning only I want to tell you there are databases. I am going through databases and there are many, many mistakes. You know, don't take any dat database as a final word. Okay. Your own experiences are more important than what are the databases because whatever data is available, they have uploaded, but everything in that is not correct. Many things are wrong and uh, somebody has to critically study and make those corrections. Otherwise, those mistakes will be repeated by all of us in coming years. And this is what first instruction I want to give to our research scholars and our researchers. So, uh, now let us go to genus Abelmoscus, the small genus, and it has 12 species, total 12 species. Po has recognized only 11 species. Uh, po means plant on a plant of the world on life. This is a Q database, and in that these are given. Now, for example, this uh, Abelmoscus hostilis is not included in uh, database, right? So what is that? And there are some species which they have not recognized. Let us go one by one. So uh, one crop that is Abelmoscus esculentus is a, it has a tremendous value. And uh, some 13,000 years ago, the seeds were uh, obtained from Ethiopia. And you know, it is a crop which has uh, different chromosome numbers, mm -hmm. right? 2n is equal to 33, 36, and 59 to 72. Mm -hmm. Any number you get. Mm -hmm. Now, not only collection is important, mm -hmm. at the same time, you have to master cytology of it. Uh, we have to study cytology. Uh, by naked eyes, we cannot understand what is the chromosome status in particular species. And uh, here, there are two, three things. Uh, what are our uh, Abel Moscus uh, faces problem? Resistance to yellow vein mugia. It's a major problem, which, of course, uh, NBPJRI has some uh, this... Uh, Wild relatives, which are, which can be used to take, I mean, uh, to take care of this disease. Root knot nematodes, fusarium wilt, uh, verticillium, and similarly, uh, I am a taxonomist. I just, you know, general taxonomy. But, you know, agriculturist or NBPJRI people, scientists are in search of, you know, uh, search of characters which are of great significance in cultivation. Those characters are now neglected by taxonomists. Little variations which we need in our crop. And from that angle, one has to study them very critically in the field. So those characters, desired characters, we have to search in wild relatives. And that is the real quality of NBPJRI scientists. Uh, uh, now, you see, this is a, uh, as per our, uh, I mean, my uh, estimate, there are 21 taxa in Abel Moscus, and uh, uh, this uh, taxa, you can see this taxa. If you go to Po, Po says that Abel Moscus angulosus is the only species, it does not recognize any variety. And I will show you these varieties are very distinct, which occur in India. Why Powe has not recognized, I don't know. Very clearly, they, they are very distinct varieties. Unfortunately, they have not uh, recognized them. And in Abel Moscus, we have one species known as Abel Moscus tuberculatus. That is also not there in uh, uh, this database. Okay. Tuberculatus, they have merged with esculentus, which is absolutely wrong. I would say absolutely because we have studied in the field as well as we have cultivated uh, and we have studied. They stand as a very distinct species, but unfortunately they have been merged. Now let us see this Abel Moscus angulosus. 
is the only species recognized. Now, this is a uh, plate from the same, uh, I mean, booklets which we have published, Abelmoscus uh, genus. And now you see this is Abelmoscus angulosus, variety angulosus. But this variety is not recognized by Poe and uh, it occurs in uh, Utakman. If you go to Utakman or uh, down south in Kerala, we get this at higher altitude. If you go to this one, Baba Budan Hills, it is a, there uh, in Baba Budan Hills and it is a very distinct variety, but it is not uh, recognized. Now, uh, this is another, you see, uh, flower color, see, then uh, uh, seeds, you see, growth habit, you see, this also is a unique, distinct variety of Abelmoscus angulosus, Abelmoscus grandiflorus. Okay. Then Abelmoscus pungens, uh, angulo, angulosus variety pungens, you see, this is also a very distinct variety which we have cultivated also. And NBPGRI has all the germplasm conserved in germplasm bank because we have deposited all the germplasm with our uh, uh, organ, I mean, NBP jarai, and this germplasm is there, right. so they can get and grow okay, and study. Similarly, Abelmoscus anguloxus, variety purpureus, purpureus. You see this purple color. Now, uh, this is very distinct, and these characters are constant. No intermediates we get, and you see the seed also. So this variety is also not recognized by uh, our. Uh, Oh. Hello, 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 somebody is talking. Uh, sir, please uh, unmute us. Uh, right. So, uh, this is this variety is also not recognized. Now, you see, I have shown you four or five varieties which have not been recognized by this one, but they are very distinct. And now it is our duty to establish them once again, and they stand and we have. These are perennial species. You know, Angulosus is a perennial species. It looks like small tree or a large shrub, and that has significance. It is a perennial, so uh, it is a one genetic resource for improvement. Now, Abelmoscus kela. Now here, from Po only, I have given the dist distributional map. I don't know. Uh, you can see this. It is endemic to India. It is endemic to India. And anything which is endemic to our country has a great significance. It is our germplasm. And every right we have on this germplasm. So this is another species of uh, interest. Then, uh, uh, sorry. Now, Abelmoscus crinitus. See, this is a very distinct. Now, I am not going to tell you all the characters which are taxo of taxonomic value. But still, you can see this uh, habit, then a uh, root system, calyx. Now, Abelmoscus crinitus, you cannot go wrong. You see this epicalyx, which is a very unique, and easily you can identify this species, right? Uh, then uh, another is Abelmoscus NBPG Rens. Okay, this is a new species which we have described. Again, it is endemic to India, and it is a uh, it has many characters which uh, uh, desired characters. Uh, for example, uh, uh, this one yellow mujak uh, disease. Y yellow mujak when disease this. This can be utilized to, uh, uh, I mean, for improvement of our crop. Now, Abelmoscus esculentus, as I told you, which is a very important crop of our country. How many turnover per day it takes place, I don't know. But this is one of the most important uh, crop. And you can see here some plants in uh, which are with yellow mujak when, uh, yellow mujak when disease. Okay, which is a major problem. And uh, already NBPJRA has uh, improved these varieties and uh, they are free from 
but in future also we need them. So Abel Moscus esculentus is important. Then this is another species which grows wildly almost uh, in Africa, in Australia, in India, and uh, it is native to India. And this is this also shows a lot of variations. This is only at species level I am talking. But if you see some grow almost a prostate, some grow erect, some are about three meters tall, some are only one meter tall. So we get great diversity within these species which can be utilized. Now this is a Abel Moscus money heart, uh, which is a, another species uh, related to Abel Moscus esculentus, right? Then this is Abel Moscus machatus, which is a, again one of the very important uh, uh, species uh, for their seeds and uh, uh, oil musk uh, uh, odor, which we get from this. And this is also an important plant for our country and economy. Now, Abel Moscus polyanus, this we collected once only. Again, we are in search of, it is a very distinct species. Again, it is endemic and we need to collect its accessions because only from one place we have collected uh, that too from Maharashtra and uh, there is a need for further collection of these species. Now see Abel Moscus rhodopetalus. Now you are seeing the photographs also. Rhodo means red, petalus means petals. Now this is Abel Moscus rhodopetalus, but unfortunately in uh, databases, it is synonymized uh, with Abel Moscus sagittifolius. I will show you sagittifolius also. Why it is merged with? If so many distinct characters are there, why it is merged with Abel Moscus sagittifolius? Okay, so I don't agree with this, but we need to study and publish paper, then only they will accept. Okay, so this is Abel Moscus rugosus. Again, it is a very distinct species. Unfortunately, it is merged with Abel Moscus sagittifolius. Okay, two species. One is rhodopetalus, another is rugosus. Both species are merged with your uh, Abel Moscus sagittifolius. So, and see this, this is Abel Moscus tuberculatus. If you see in Povo, this species, even name is not mentioned in Abel Moscus and it is, uh, it is synonymized with Abel Moscus esculentus. Now you see the Bendy. You know, Bendy is a very different and now here see these tubercles on the fruits, which are very, very unique. See the seeds and rugo seeds, which are also very distinct. In addition to that, this is a wildly growing plant in cultivated fields and buns. And throughout India, peninsular India, we get this Abel Moscus esculentus. So those who are interested in this genus, they can work out it and publish a paper that Abel Moscus tuberculatus stands as a distinct species. And it is it has nothing to do with Abel Moscus esculentus. So this is one research problem. Anyone, any scientist who is interested, they can do some further research and publish a paper on this, uh, I mean, uh, status of Abel Moscus tuberculatus. So this is the problem which I have given and they can publish the paper. Now let us go to another Abel Moscus. This is a species I should tell you in Dehradun. In Dehradun, in front of BSI, Circle Botanical uh, Indian Botan uh, sorry um, Botanical Survey of India. There they have cultivated this species. You can see our KV bud and my, our student. They are looking at this. This stands as a distinct species, but only we once we collected further work we have not done. So those who are interested in this, they can uh, uh, reach to BSI Dehradun collect material, study, compare with other species, and if it has some distinct characters, they should publish as a new species, okay? So this 
I am giving, I am uh, requesting you people because I am now uh, 69 years old. I cannot take these uh, challenges. You people have to take. And this is also one of the very important uh, germplasm for us, but its status needs to be uh, established. So this is Abel Moscus from um, uh, BSI. BSI in front of BSI office, we have these plants planted. They are perennial and uh, somebody has to work on it. So this is about Abel Moscus. We have given key. There are some mistakes. I know there are some mistakes which need to be at that time we were doing, but with uh, uh, available literature now, a lot of literature is available. We have to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, prepare a key which will really help us in correct identity of the species. So this key we have given, I will not go to that. See the diversity of Abel Moscus. About only 12 or 15 species in the world and uh, somebody can take up and revise the genus for the entire world because all germplasm is with us, is with NBP JRI. So revising genus is another uh, research problem for any young worker in NBP JRI. So these are the, uh, see the diversity of our Abel Moscus, which we collected during our time. And any help, if you need from our side, from my side, I am there to help you to take you to the field, collect the specimens and do revisionary. And that way, all these wild relatives of our Abel Moscus definitely will be boon to improve Abel Moscus esculentus and uh, uh, that way it has a great significance. Okay, See the fruit diversity in Abel Moscus, right? These are the fruit diversity. Papers have been published and here you can see now if you compare fruits of all the species, see this Abel Moscus tuberculatus. Whether it, it has to do something with Abel Moscus esculentus, nothing. This is very different. This is very different. Uh, and then we very rarely we are very uh, we are not critical or we don't go serious about anything. And that's why such mistakes we do make. OK, so remember this uh, photograph, which will be helpful to you. And all these are our uh, diversity of couple mosques. Right. Uh, then seeds. See these seeds also. Already some paper has been published and uh, uh, seeds also are of taxonomic value. Uh, seed characters are of taxonomic uh, value in identification of species. Okay. Now let us come to kukumis, kakadi. Kakadi is another very important crop which has been domesticated in our country and uh, about kakadi, especially kukumis mellow and kukumis sativus. These are two very, very important world crops. And here, wild relatives are very important. With modern molecular studies, many species of mucia, mucina and, and many other genera have been merged with uh, cucumis. So uh, accepted species throughout the world uh, are 61 species. Okay? And in India, if you see, uh, there are about 20 taxa, okay, varieties plus species, and 14 species are from India. Among them, what are the most important species? Uh, Cucumis sativus and Cucumis mellow. So these are two very important crops. Now let us go to the taxonomy of this group. Uh, now see Cucumis cetosis, right? This is a species. We made extensive survey throughout peninsular India, collected germplasm, and this species, you know, in Puvo, Cucumis trigonus is a synonym, uh, uh, you know, with Cucumis mellow. This species is merged with Cucumis mellow. Cucumis mellow is an annual plant. Okay, it is usually cultivated plant, but Cucumis callosus is a, you know, Cucumis callosus is a, it has a tuberous root. 
it is a perennial it is woody and it grows in extremely dry conditions so if you want genes for drought resistance this is the species but unfortunately this species has been merged with a uh, cucumis mellow it stands as a distinct species again this is a problem for research scholars who can do it and prove it and this will be very important for uh, i mean uh, 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 drought resistant crops this is the, it grows in extremely dry conditions okay now another cucumis dispersius i will not talk much but it is a species which was introduced in india as a ornamental plant and now if you go to peninsular india mysore bangalore koimatur in west places around city you get this species and this is cucumis dispersius i don't know but it has a ornamental value and it is spreading in uh, as a weed not weed i mean escape they are growing in a uh, west places around cities so this is a cucumis dispersius which is a uh, from africa but now it is found in india okay so this is another thing then uh, cucumis hystrix this is a species for which we spend about uh, one week in northeast india very difficult task to collect it you know so this you can see this is the part where it is it grows and we were searching searching kv bhat sahab and myself and finally we could collect this species this is cucumis hystrix it is not bitter it is edible another thing edible uh, not like other uh, cucumis edible and very important germplasm now see this is the one then in that also we have i mean diversity local diversity here you see the tubercles of the fruit see these tubercles and see these tubercles if you go to this see these tubercles these are uh, solan at the base okay so solan at the base so this diversity also we get so this is another then cucumis indicus initially it was a melothria ricci right melothria ricci now it has been merged with uh, i mean this uh, genus cucumis the genus is merged with uh, cucumis and it has name cucumis indicus what is important about it uh it grows in western ghats it is endemic to western ghats okay you can see this and in rainy season it is very common in western ghat these fruits local people they collect and eat so another edible species of cucumis which is endemic to india is with us and you people have to see that the germplasm is maintained and utilized in further improvement of our uh, kakdi okay so this is one then uh, cucumis javanicus originally it is was melothria javanicus this is merged of course uh, this is found again in a uh, northeast india right then cucumis uh, leiospermus which is found throughout india also found in ceylon also and uh, it has a larger fruits in cucumis uh, madras patana fruits are small here the fruits are large and they are red in color they are edible also now this is cucumis madras patana which is common throughout india we get it and uh, i don't know how we can utilize it for improvement of our uh, uh, cucumis crop right now this is cucumis mellow which shows lot of variations cucumis melo variety agrestris which is a uh, very common right and uh, you see we get great range of it and it hybridizes with our uh, cucumis melo uh, and produces lot of uh, i mean uh, this what we call hybrid swarms with lot of fruit diversity so this is a cucumis mellow variety agrestis still it crosses and that way it is a good material so cucumis mellow has many edible varieties you can see this edible varieties 
and I will not talk about edible. You are better people to talk about them. But these we collected. Uh, our uh, Joseph was instrumental to collect. Now, finally, one more thing I want to tell. Uh, the species Cucumis muricatus was published by Chakravarti. Here, if you see this herbarium seed, see the fruit. Fruit is oval. And then I showed you Cucumis uh, hystrix. Now, see this hystrix, which we uh, studied. Now, this Cucumis uh, muricatus is doesn't stand as a distinct species, okay? And now it is synonymized with Cucumis hystrix. So it is one and the same. Uh, this does not stand as a distinct species, Cucumis muricatus. Now this is a mis not mistake, latter understanding. Uh, and this we should not recognize as a distinct species, although it is recognized in our pamphlets. So I am accepting what are the lacunies? What are the mistakes which are there in pamphlet? Don't believe that whatever is written by us is perfectly correct. Now, Muricatus is merged with Cucumis hystrix. Right. Now, this is another very yeah, beautiful species. Again, it is a drought resistance. You can see many times this species is mistaken for Cucumis hystrix or Cucumis uh, Muricatus. See this because of each in it, but it is a very distinct from those because I have seen when I was interacting with scientists of uh, NBP Jarai, uh, these people sometimes they have mistaken this species as a hystrix, but this is a uh, Cucumis propatorum which grows in extremely dry conditions. And you can see these fruits, it is bitter also, and one of the uh, the species which has genes for drought resistance. So that way we can think of these species. Then Cucumis ricci. Uh, I don't know. On molecular basis, Cucumis uh, Diculospermum ricci has been merged with Cucumis. The seeds are very unique. If you see seed, if you give me seed, immediately I will tell the identity of the species. So here, Seeds of cucurbits are of unique nature. Their characters are very unique and they are very good for identification of species. Cucumis ricci, on both sides of seed, there are balloon-like structures and that way it is very distinct. It is endemic to India. And these fruits are also edible. Okay. So this way, this is another germplasm endemic to India and it is your treasure. Then Cucumis sativus, which is a, another important crop. And we have Cucumis sativus, variety sativus, Cucumis sativus, variety sicumensis. So, uh, variety sicumensis, you can see this sicumensis. It is very distinct. So, these are cultivars, and you people are better uh, because you work with these crops. My studies are limited about their uh, local races, local varieties. Okay. Now see this, Cucumis, you know, this I told you, you get such a variations in this Cucumis sativus. See, in a one field, in one field, we collected fruits of Cucumis sativus, okay, or hystrix, and we have arranged it this way and see the size variations. So great diversity, great, great, amazing diversity of fruits we get in Cucumis sativus. And this uh, Cucumis uh, uh, sativus, Pharma hardwicki. This is Pharma hardwicki. In this also, we get a lot of variations. You see, purely white, then greenish, then stripped. So there also we get a lot and it is considered to be progenitor of Cucumis sativa. Okay. And that's why this germplasm is of great significance to us. Right. Now, uh, then Cucumis cetosus. Now, this is another species. 
and for many years world was not knowing that there is one species known as cucumis setosus which grows in northern western ghats it is endemic to northern western ghats and you see this is a cucumis setosus the on fruits you see the hairs brown colored hairs so it is a setosus cucumis setosus this is a dry fruit and in bhima shankar area these fruits are sold in the market to the visitors and they are edible this is another very important cucumis species with us which we should i mean uh, of course you have to uh, uh, conserve you have to do conservation of germplasm but in addition to this can you improve or can you develop this as a crop right this as a crop for farmers so this has a great significance you people can think of can you increase the size of this fruit and they are very tasty also and it can be a, a good crop for future right and then another species of cucumis cucumis salentfolia which is also very unique it grows in kerala endemic to kerala and uh, it is a unique how the fruit dehisces see the fruit fruit opens at the top and from that seeds come out this is a very unique phenomenon of seed dispersal or a seed release in this species this is also very edible species and you have this germplasm so i showed you kukumi species and their importance for us so this is these are the fruits you can see these fruits and fruits are so unique i feel that nbpjri scientist any one young scientist should take a challenge of collecting all the cucurbits of our country and i mean bringing pictorial guide to the cucurbits of india if you decide today it may take 5 years 10 years and some day we will have a beautiful pictorial book on cucurbits of india this is my wish and this is my request to young scientist at this age i cannot take this challenge i should have been now uh, in the age of 30 i would have taken this challenge and made it so for you people it is not difficult so seeds are unique fruits are unique and uh, this is the key which we have given but there are some mistakes uh, we have to uh, i mean improve the booklet okay so this is one thing which i told you and uh, you can go ahead with this now i come to the another important uh, uh, genus that is genus vigna and our uh, dr k v but used to say vigna is a vigna vigna means very taxonomically very difficult task for us very difficult task for us vigna okay why it is said vigna right it is a uh, for taxonomist it is a nightmare okay uh, very difficult to say now this genus vigna which is a very important for i mean legumes are very important crops for entire world for protein requirement nitrogen i mean for enriching soil and that way leguminous crops are of great significance to human beings now you see this changing climate and changing uh, environment we need to go for uh, new crops improvement of crop and so on and here legumes are one of the important group where we should concentrate now you see uh, in a nut cell uh, o recognizes 100 hyus species for the world in india accepted species are 29 out of that indigenous or native are 23 23 species are native to our country and among them three are of great significance as a crop plants okay so those we will see and uh, here lot of research needs to be done so this is a classification and that i will not go i just want to introduce this group now this is vigna acunitifolia 
throughout India it grows. Okay, but uh, there are two forms. One is cultivated, and another one is wild form. Wild form has something. You know, this is a uh, Vigna acunitifolia, folia, and uh, it is. I mean. It is uh, distributed in uh, China, in uh, Myanmar, and Pakistan, and so on. This is a distributional range and also introduced in Africa. So, Matki, uh, Vigna aconitifolia, I, the common English name I get confused anyway. So, we call it as a Matki, which is also very important. And Kolapuri is known for uh, Kolapuri missile. And without Matki, Missile has no taste. So this is a very important crop and its wild relatives we must know. Okay. And this is a cultivated uh, farm and wild farms. So directly probably, I mean that wild farm, from that we have domesticated this crop and this is a very important crop. Now it is Vigna angularis, which is a cultivated so I will not go much about, uh, for, about cultivated plants. So it is cultivated, especially in Northeast India or throughout India. So this is one species, which is a uh, angularis, uh, right? Then this is a Vigna trinarivia variety borni. Now it has been Vigna borni. It is treated as a distinct species. But in our booklet, we have treated it as a variety of trinervia. Now trinervia, uh, it is Vigna borni. Okay. So this is also very elegant species, which grows in Western Ghats. And you can see this Karnataka, uh, this uh, which is the Ghat area, I should tell you, Charmadi Ghat. Charmadi Ghat, it is a very common plant. In Ghat area only it grows. And it has leaves, blotching on the leaves, trilobed leaves. And uh, this is a unique species with, uh, I mean, of uh, promise. Okay. Then this is Vigna um, uh, clerki. So far, I have not collected this Vigna clerki. Uh, probably uh, NVP Jarai may have uh, germplasm of this. But if you see the distribution, it is restricted to this Arunachal, I mean, uh, this one, Himalaya, and then our Northeast India. So far, I have not collected. So you people should make attempt to collect this germplasm. Okay. Now, then this is a Vigna Daljeliana. Now, this is one confusing species. It produces both clistogamous flowers, sometimes subterranean flowers, and it is a very common species in Western Ghats. Almost in all parts, on all hilly regions, along roadsides, we get this species. And, uh, you know, it is a very distinct. Now, all these characters which are there, I will not talk about. Keel and this one, then st the style. These are important characters, you know, uh, for identification of species. Then stipules, they are of great significance pods and seeds, they are significant. Even seedling, first leaf, pear is also of taxonomic value. So when you study here, you can see this, what characters need to be studied. And this is probably self-pollinated crop. And therefore, they maintain their distinctness in nature. Okay, we don't get hybrids. So Daljeliana is one with the great variations. Uh, uh, then. This is, uh, again, uh, Vigna glabricans. It is tetraploid. All others are with uh, diploids. This is a tetraploid and uh, it is cultivated also. And see this uh, species, which is a tetraploid. And if our scientists are able to, I mean, uh, make matki, I mean, uh, Aval, uh, sorry, Vigna aconitifolia, then our Vigna mungo, Vigna radiata, 
if they can make them tetraploid by some chemical treatment, some treatment, uh, they will be of uh, it will be of great significance, but definitely it needs a lot of efforts. Okay, so this is one robust species which we have. Then Vigna heniana, uh, uh, described by our great Professor Babu. Uh, and you can see this. This species is very unique. What I want to tell you, nobody can go wrong. Just you touch the plant, lower surface, it has woolly hairs. No other species has such a woolly hairs and you have very uh, pleasant feel when you move your finger on lower side of the leaf. So this is another uh, plant, Heniana. Uh, which is endemic to our area. So we have very good germplasm of Vigna, genus Vigna in our country, and those are promising. Now Vigna hosi is an introduced species as a fodder crop or as a ground cover, and uh, this, uh, this is a cultivated in our country. Okay. Then our uh, Vigna indica. Now I will uh, tell you the story uh, of this species, this Vigna indica, you know, this species has, uh, I mean, trilobed leaves. So, uh, this species grows from, I mean, Rajasthan, Delhi, up to Kanyakumari in drier parts. Now it has trilobed leaves and it was confused with Aconitifolia. It was confused with Stipulatia it was confused with Vigna trilobat. So there was a lot of confusion. And uh, I mean, nobody took uh, uh, note of it. When critical analysis was done, this was uh, undescribed species, though it is a very common, it was undescribed species, which has been described as a Vigna indica. Fian Naik described Vigna trilobata variety pusila from Aurangabad, but this stands as a distinct species and it is named as Vigna indica, which is endemic. Now, why this species is very important? It grows in a very poor soils, uh, in a Malran areas. It has a draw, it is a drought resistance. I have not seen any disease, I mean, uh, any disease on it. And similarly, it grows prostate and that way it has many genes probably which are of your significance in improving our Vignas. Okay, so this is one. Then Vigna Khandalensis is another species. Uh, probably in the world, it is a unique species, I would say. It is a very robust species growing up to two to three meter in height. Its stem diameter is about one inch, right? Or sometimes more than that. And it is a most robust species found in Western Ghats. It is again endemic to Western Ghats and it has a very large stipules, very large leaves. And uh, if you see in nature, really you will be very happy to see the robust species of Vigna, Vigna Khandalensis, and that is endemic to our country. And I think in breeding programs, this will be a very inter interesting material, right? Vigna Khandalensis. Uh, now, uh, uh, then one more species, Vigna Konkanensis has been described from India, right? By our uh, Lata, uh, KV Bhatt, Beast. Okay. And this is that Vigna uh, Konkanensis which is having glabrous fruits, which have glabrous fruits. And these characters, what are the differences I have given? So this is also endemic and it is related to our Vigna mungo. Uh, yes, Vigna mungo. And uh, uh, it will be of significance in a, uh, further breeding programs of our Vigna. Okay, so this is a one species which has been described. Uh, recently. So Vigna luteola. Now this is a species you can see it in northeast India. It is a, 
shown here, but I don't know. I have not collected it. It is these are the photographs from uh, Po, and one should collect these species as it is also found in North East India. I have not collected it myself. Then Vigna marina. Now this is a. Uh, if you go to Andaman along, uh, I mean seashores in sandy soils, it grows. Now how you will utilize it for further improvement of our vignas, you see this is a plot. It grows profusely, has a great foliage. So as a foliage, foliage plant, also it can be grown. And uh, it grows in somewhat saline or sandy soil. And this way it has uh, significance uh, in, uh, uh, for us. Okay, So this is vigna marina. Uh, which I grow, I was growing at Shivaji University. It grows to huge size on wire warehouse. It was growing so nicely, producing fruits. I could maintain for some time, but you know, I have my own limitations to uh, grow all these germplasm, but NBP Jarai has great strength and all these species, I think we should have a field gene bank at some place where we can grow all these species. So this is Vigna marina. And then Vigna minima. This is also recorded from uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and I am sure it will be there in Northeast India, but I have not collected and you have, I mean, you have scope to collect it. Oh, then Vigna mukherjianus has been described in 1980 in Indian Journal of Forest. I don't have I, uh, information, but you keep these species to your list, which need to be collect, collected, and it is a endemic to our country. Now, Vigna Mungo. Vigna Mungo uh, is another problem because it's a wild form also grows. Uh, and, uh, whether to recognize it as a variety, recognize it as a uh, subspecies, or recognize it as a species, it depends on a worker. You know, uh, our Darwin, long back in 1859, he said whether to recognize particular species as a species or subspecies or variety is a jurisdiction of a taxonomist or jurisdiction of a person. So uh, always you will see a lot of confusions. Uh, sometimes we recognize subspecies, sometimes varieties, sometimes as a distinct species. So anyway, that is that will go on because it is a concept and therefore it keeps on changing. This is Vigna Mungo, which is a very important. And you know, uh, Udid Vada in Karnataka, which is a, uh, very famous and this is a crop and we have a number of diseases on it uh, where we need wilder relatives, right? Then Vigna Nepalensis, you can see this, uh, you people, this is one uh, program you have to take. It occurs in Himalayan region and in uh, Arunachal Pradesh also. So we have to collect it and uh, this is one challenge for you. Then Vigna Pandiana, which is very close to uh, Vigna Daljeli. Okay, Vigna Daljeli, Vigna Pandiana, and Vigna uh, your uh, Vigna Yadavi. These three species are closely related. Vigna Daljeli it produces subterranean flowers also, Clistogamous flowers, chasmogamic flowers. Same way, this Pandiana and Yadavi, both of them produce a clistogamous as well as chasmogamous flowers, and it forms a complex. Okay, three species: Daljeliana, Pandiana, and your Yadavi. These three species form a complex, and now it is challenge for you to solve this complex. Okay, these three species are recognized. Uh, but further studies, molecular studies are needed. And uh, this is endemic to India. 
and has variations. So this is one problem for you people to resolve. Then sir, Vigna Radiata. Sir, excuse me, sir. Uh, yes. Slide, slide is not moving after Vigna Mungo. Vigna Mungo, it is not moving. Uh, now, has it come? Nepalensis? No, sir. No, no. What has happened, bhai? Oh. Should I start again? Yeah, sir, yes, sir. Uh, stop uh, sharing and uh, I will stop do. Stop sharing and then uh, again share, sir. Right. That will be good. Has it come? Ah, yes, sir. Now it is coming. Ah, Vigna Nepalensis. This is uh, for you people to collect because it has to be there and we need to collect it. Okay, so this is one thing I told you. I was telling about Vigna Daljaliana, Vigna uh, Pandiana, and Vigna Yadavi. These three species are closely related. I myself have some doubts also. And, but they have some distinct differences. So it is a complex, and this is a problem for you people, those who are molecular biologists, okay, biochemists, they should further investigate in these species. Uh, and uh, Vigna Daljil is also you know, a very common species throughout India, showing great variations. So this is one problem for you. To... Mm, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Now, Vigna radiata. Are you able to see slide? Hello? Hello? Sir, uh, uh, Vigna radiata. Now, this is one. Uh, uh, Munga. Uh, we have uh, this is uh, that uh, species, you know, you know. Then Vigna sahyadriana. This we described. See, when we started working with this Vigna, and we published this pamphlet. After that, many new species came. So there is a need for revisionary work on this that forms a basis for other workers because everyone cannot reach to every place and collect materials. People collect and describe new species. So Vigna Sahyadriana, you can see in Western Ghat, it is very common. It grows at higher altitude and it has many, many fruits. Fruit bearing is very high, and that character, which is desired character, uh, which is present in this, and this is Vigna Sayadriana, endemic to India, especially Western Ghats, is one of the species which has a great potential uh, as a wild relative of Mung. Okay, then Vigna Satishiana is a new species described. I have, I mean, I have to yet to study that species. Uh, you people should collect. And uh, I am giving a latest account of uh, Vigna species from India. Now, this is Vigna sylvestris. Now, you see in Konkan, see this hairiness here. See this characters of this one. And this was recognized as a Vigna sylvestris. But uh, unfortunately, this Vigna sylvestris has been merged with Vigna mungo. Okay, Vigna mungo. Uh, I don't know. This grows as a wild. Vigna mungo, we cultivate. And this, I mean, it climbs in a bushes. And Vigna mungo is cultivated. This is a wild form of Vigna, uh, Vigna mungo, or we should treat as a distinct species, is a problem for me. Now, you people with modern tools, you can establish its identity either as a distinct species or as a wild form of Vigna Mungo. So this is another problem for you to do. Okay. Now this is a great confusion for me. Vigna stipulatia. Okay. Vigna stipulatia. When I was going through Vigna stipulatia, lot of confusion I saw. And now you can see this stipule is very large. Now this plant, grows throughout India in marshy places, in rice fields, in the abandoned fields. It is a common plant, especially where there is a moisture. And it is very distinct in its uh, beautiful large stipule. So it is a stipulatia. Okay. 
and it grows like this. You can see it is a common plant. Uh, sorry. And uh, see these images of Vigna stipulatia. So this is a Vigna stipulatia. And you can see this large stipule. It is a figure from internet. Uh, okay. And what has happened? Uh, that species is not recognized uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a, our poo. So that also needs to be established. So Vigna sublobata, this is a wild form, Vigna sublobata, and very distinct. So sometimes that Vigna uh, stipulatia is treated as a Vigna, Vigna uh, sublobata, but this is a very distinct. So, lot of confusions. I told you it is a Vigna for a taxonomist. Lot of confusions. So, Vigna radiata, variety sublobata, is merged, Vigna stipulatia is merged with uh, Vigna radiata variety, uh, sorry, variety sublobata. Now, you tell me here, I am showing you figures. This is sublobata. This is stipulatia, which grows prostate. This grows uh, as a, a twiner, as climber. Okay. Now they have so much differences. Why we should not recognize this as a distinct species? So this is one problem for you, uh, which you need to resolve. Right. Okay. Now. Vigna subramanianum, which grows in Himachal Pradesh and Kerala, I have collected. And uh, see this stipule, is, which is a very unique character, pods, small pods, and uh, seed. So, uh, sorry. This is Vigna subterraneana, which is uh, cultivated in India. So, uh, I need not to tell much about cultivated. It is cultivated. Then Vigna trilobata. Now see, many times Vigna trilobata is confused with Vigna indica, Vigna acunitifolia, and uh, uh, Vigna stipulatia. Vigna trilobata is very unique. As far as my knowledge goes, it grows in a Tamil Nadu area. You see, this is the area where it is reported. It does not occur in upper part of our country. So this Vigna is very unique. It is a wild species. It grows in a sandy soil along the seashores or in Tamil Nadu. And if you see the seed of this species, you see this areole. Okay, this areole is so unique. No taxonomist can get confused with Vigna trilobata with any other species. Its the seed is so distinct and leaves are blotched. You know, blotched leaves we get. And that way, this is a unique species, which is uh, again dot resistance. It, uh, and it has very distinct seeds. So you can read the literature and one should not. In TV, I mean, NBPJRI, there is a lot of confusion about Aconitifolia. Stipulatia, then your trilobata, and one more species, what is that? Uh, indica. So there is a confusion. So that confusion, you read literature and get it can, uh, I mean, clear. Okay. Now, this is Vigna trinervia trinervia. Vigna trinervia now, they have merged with Vigna radiata variety radiata. So it may be correct also. And that way, this needs to be confirmed. Okay. Vigna radiata radiata. This is the uh, seed. Then Vigna ambulata is a cultivated species. Uh, as well as it is wild also in, uh, uh, I mean, Northeast India. So you can see this Northeast India we have. Similarly, in South India also we get. And uh, you see this keel, then style stipule and fruits and seed diversity. So it is a cultivated species as well as wild we have. Then Vigna umbelata, umbelata we have a lot of this one. 
Now Vigna vexillata. Again, Vigna vexillata is another uh, plant, and uh, this is variety typica, forma typica, and it is, grows widely throughout the world. Vigna vexillata. It is widely distributed. Then we have Vigna vexillata variety angustifolia. So see the leaves, and they are very unique, and it is shown that throughout India it grows. Then Vigna vexillata, variety vexillata. Uh, first, no, I mean, it is a synonym of Vigna vexillata. Okay. Leo carpa is now merged with Vigna vexillata, variety vexillata. Then this Vig Vigna vexillata, variety stocksai. Now, you know, if you go to Baba Bhutan Hills, in grasslands, if you search for Vigna vexillata, this is that Vigna vexillata from Baba Budan Hills. And you see this tuber, you know, below tuber. It grows in grasslands. And see this brown hairs on calyx. Very unique. See the flower. See the fruit. Okay, brown hairs. And see the seeds. It is a very distinct variety of Vigna vexillata, but it is not given in Po. Okay, so here we have given this. There are a lot of variations within this species in the form of varieties. And this is another germplasm to your service. Okay. Uh, so Vigna vexillata. This is Vigna vexillata. Vigna unguiculata. Again, it is a cultivated species. Uh, I need not to talk. Sauli, which is very, uh, this one. And finally, I told you Vigna yadavi, which has been described. Of course, you will be happy. I am happy that Vigna yadavi is named after me. But I told you Vigna daljiliana, Vigna pandia, pandiana, with Vigna yadavi. There is the, this form a complex, and there is need for uh, further studies. So this is a Vigna yadavi, which has been described, and these are the differences which are given. Uh, and you have one more problem to resolve. Okay. Uh, then, so this is a Vigna whitey. Sorry, that Vigna whitey is another species which needs to be. Sorry, what is Vigna whitey? Um, lectotypification has been done, and this species is not given in uh, Po, and this has been described from southwestern Ghats. It is a very different species, and uh, we should collect the germplasm, study more, and establish or uh, throw light on it uh, as a distinct species. So this has been, there is one paper also, lectotypification, you can go through, right? So this is one additional species, and you can see this big knots, uh, the flower, flower size, flower color, all these are unique. Then the seeds, you know, workers should take care of seeds in Vigna. They are of great diagnostic value in determination of species. And you see this Vigna trilobata, I told you, is a very unique in its uh, areole, right? You cannot get confused with Stipulatia or with uh, Aconiti polia, or with Indica. So this is a Vigna Indica, where it is Vigna Indica. See this Indica and see this. Nobody can get confused with this, okay? So this is the one thing we have given you this pamphlet, but there are a lot of mistakes which need to be corrected. Now, you know, uh, our legumes are very important. You people should concentrate. 2016 was the international year of pulses, and pulses have a lot of importance. It is a good source of proteins. It is an excellent source of fiber, high antioxidants, gluten-free, sodium-free, cholesterol-free, iron-rich. So if you want really nutritional food, we need uh, this one, uh, your uh, legumes. Good source of potassium, excellent source of folate, Okay, they are natural fertilizers, drought tolerance, and frost hardy. They are direct; they can be directly sown, and they are water efficient. All these advantages are with legume crops. 
So our NBP JRI should really concentrate on dehumes and their wild relatives. And uh, if they need my help, I am always to their service because I take NBP JRI is a national institute. It is my institute. Okay. So uh, this food security and these legumes, they are playing, they will play a great role in coming years. And this way, you know, there are so many legumes. And for every group, I cannot talk. I have taken only Vigna. It is uh, true for every other legume crops, uh, grain legumes, and you have a lot of challenge to do it, okay? With these words, okay, I have tried to uh, complete it in a 45, uh, sorry, one hour. Of course, hurriedly I have gone, but I have tried to introduce all the species of Abelmoscus, Vigna, and Kukumis, and what are the problems where our NBP JRI scientists should work. Also, I have said that you need hardcore taxonomists uh, to help you, without which it goes difficult to decide status of species, variety, or anything. And that way, NBPGRI should take help of taxonomists from universities, from colleges, that will be great help. And they are working in their own area, and that becomes a great help to NBPGRI. Uh, once again, I thank Ravi for giving me opportunity to say what I wanted to say about these three crops. Similarly, I am thankful to our director for giving me opportunity. If there are some questions, uh, we can uh, go ahead with questions. Okay, I will do stop sharing so that I can answer. Sir, thank okay. you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, participants, please kindly, if you have any doubts. Um, sir, a lot of uh, participants requested your presentation, sir. Uh, yeah, right? I will uh, I will uh, send it to you today yes, only. Sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Myself, Dr. Ishnugiti, sir, from Badnapur, Maharashtra. Uh -huh. Sir, thank we you. maintain the near about in wild species of Higna yeah. and also use these wild species in development of breeding programs. Right. But yeah. sir, there is a one problem that how we identify these uh, wild species from one another because ah. there is a uh, very minute uh, difference between these wild species. Sir. Yeah, right. Also, we handling the uh, wild, uh, this breeding program of PGNP crops. We maintain ah. 15 wild species of Higna and 9 wild species of Kajanus groups. Right. And in Higna groups, we are handling the F8, F9 generation of this wild species. Huh. Uh, wild species that are uh, used in our processing program, Higna Silvestri, Sublobata, then Glabarus, Hynia. Process uh, your success. But my question is that how to identify one uh, unidentified species to register in NBPGR? Uh, now you know, see, uh, that is what I in the end I have said you need a hardcore taxonomist who has some experience, okay? For me also, it was uh, difficult and in the, I have accepted also openly there are mistakes in our booklets. Don't take it as a final. Don't take O as a final because there are gaps in knowledge. Uh, we need very close observations, both in the wild as well as when we grow plants in the field and see whether whatever differences we say, see, they are distinct, they are inherited, and that way, Vigna especially, uh, 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 I can help you in correct identity of Vigna species, uh, and we can come together and make a nice key for all the species of Vigna in India, right? I have given you now, there are about 29 species, if we come together, sit, think, discuss, and then make a key, okay, along with even some photographs attached to that key, uh, NBPGRI scientists will not go wrong in identification. So that way we have to work, okay? So this is what I feel. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, 
sir our uh, next speaker also joined and uh, dear participants uh, if you have any doubts kindly post in uh, chat box uh, okay no, i mean i should not because you have started late by 15 minutes ah uh, yes sir yes sir yes, so, yes. <laughs> because yes, uh, I, and any no. uh, any doubts uh, dear uh, trainees uh, if they have doubts, my uh, I mean uh, I will be sending my presentation. They can ask me. Yes, uh, I am also not a uh, god, which uh -huh. every question I can answer. But there are difficulties, and all of us we have to together think, yes. discuss, and come to conclusion. And mm -hmm. we have to be very open. First thing I told, we have to be very open. I have told here this needs to be described as a new species. You can describe. Uh, that open, we have to be with each other and then only we can do. Otherwise, you know, um, uh, uh, not showing to anyone, doing in one corner, trying to publish one paper. Publishing paper is one part of life, but really becoming knowledgeable is a real part of our knowledge, I mean, uh, humanity. And that's why I should say we have to be very open yes. and then only it can be achieved, right? Uh, sir, uh, I hope, uh, sir, participants also enjoyed with your presentation, sir. Uh, let it is a time for uh, telling, propose the vote of thanks. Okay, sir, really, sure. Go ahead. Uh, I am really thankful to you, sir, uh, on behalf of my organization team and other members for sharing your knowledge and uh, key characteristic diagnostic features of genus uh, Abelmoscus, Cucumis, and uh, Vigna. Exclusively in a Vigna species, sir, uh, there is a lot of confusion. I am also working on that particular genus. Yeah. And uh, it is very, sir, highly knowledgeable and uh, highly informative presentation, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, Jyoti, ma'am, and Sar also joined, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes. I... Next, uh, sir. <clears throat> Yes, sir has joined. Uh, uh, sir has joined. <clears throat> I am requesting uh, Jyoti ma'am, please uh, let introduce uh, our speaker. Okay. Sir, good, good afternoon, yeah. sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. So, uh, good morning to all the participants and thank you, Ravi, uh -huh. for giving me this opportunity. So, uh, so I would like to welcome Dr. Nabzit Singh Bas a renowned wheat breeder and who retired as a director of research Punjab Agricultural University recently. So, sir, we welcome you in this training program to deliver your lecture on the pre-breeding uh, in uh, wheat. So, I would like to say a few words about sir. So, uh, Dr. Bais, who was a student of PAU, he acquired his degree of graduation, master's and PhD from PAU Ludhiana. And after that, uh, sir has uh, obtained postdoctorate fellowship from ED also. And uh, afterwards, sir has uh, done another postdoctor fellowship from Ohio State University, USA. And uh, sir has joined the PAU in 1991 as assistant plant breeder. And after that, uh, sir did marvelous work for the wheat breeding, durum wheat breeding and critical breeding. So during the course of Pulsar has developed more than a uh, dozen variety of bread wheat, durum wheat, and critical. And his work on the bread wheat and uh, critical and durum varieties led to their adoption and cultivation by major industrial players of the country. As durum wheat has major role in the industry, it, it is used in the several product formation, pasta, suji, and all. So such variety is the leading variety in the wheat market. Regarding teaching and training programs, so Sir was a very popular teacher and very popular researcher among the students. So whenever people used to go to field, any researcher, so Sir used to be in the field in the early morning itself. So Sir has guided 16 masters and PhD students during his career. And he has published more than 100 research articles in the reputed journals. So uh, thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation to deliver the lecture in our tra training program, sir. Sir, please, uh, you can uh, uh, share your slide. 
And here, sir, uh, I would like to tell you that most of the par participants are from breeding background only. They are working on different crops uh, uh, like wheat, pulse, oil seeds, some tree species, ornamental crops like that. But most of them are from uh, breeding background, sir. So they are very much interested in learning the things related to uh, breeding aspects and all, sir. So thank you, sir. Welcome again. Yeah, thank you, NBPGR, and thank you, Dr. Jyoti, Dr. Ravi. Uh, for this opportunity, uh, and uh, I'm happy to learn that a um, uh, good number of participants are from plant breeding, because uh, I have to be talking from that perspective, that being my background and training. Uh, so I, I would now try to share my slides. Hope it goes well. Mm -hmm. So is it Jyoti coming on? Sir, uh, a presentation mode may not be, sir. Uh, please uh, do it in presentation mode. Is, now is it, it is okay, sir. Yeah, coming, sir. It's okay now. It's coming, sir. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yeah, Fine, sir. You. So this is uh, the topic that was assigned. And uh, uh, is, uh, I was uh, agreed to this topic. And I, but uh, when uh, I started preparing, uh, yesterday, uh, I, I, I could see that handling the whole of the cereal crops uh, uh, is a daunting task in a single presentation. Uh, I, I was uh, teaching a course at PAU uh, where I was uh, in, in, that was basically a cytogenetics course, which had then evolved into a, a crop genomes course. And in that we were having my part of the course dealt with the wheat, uh, rice and maize. So pretty much uh, covering the cereals. But then when I remembered the kind of content available there and the uh, so much of research uh, uh, available in these crops uh, in the pre-breeding and genetic enhancement zone, uh, I could see it's uh, so means I did some little trickery here just sampled things here and there. So I hope it works for most of the participants, given the time we have with this. And then this is, I would rather begin, it's more like a salutation to some of the stalwarts in this area. And rather begin with some examples because here our trainees are from plant breeding and we need to really emphasize uh, where pre-breeding has gone on to deliver products of great plant breeding significance, where they have become uh, uh, commercially very important. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just take up some examples within uh, rice and wheat. Mm -hmm and uh, then move on uh, to a bit of a research component uh, where I would restrict myself mostly to wheat and mostly to the program with which I have been associated. And that would just serve as a case study hmm? because uh, all of you, uh, I guess, are young researchers and uh, you're looking to develop a perspective uh, on these uh, in this area. And uh, just to give you a bird's eye view of a case study of wheat you know, pre-breeding work at PAU uh, might just uh, provide you some framework uh, to see how things, uh, how you integrate uh, different aspects of breeding and uh, make use of the uh, pre-breeding uh, techniques. So this is uh, starting here with the, uh, the example of grassy stunt virus. Now that's gone on to become very classical. And uh, I've been telling my students that these few examples, if you remember, I think uh, you can kind of carry a very sound uh, kind of foundation about the role of pre-breeding in uh, crop improvement. So here, uh, uh, this is about the grassy stunt virus. Now just after in the 1970s, uh, just after dwarf varieties had started becoming popular in the rice growing areas of uh, South and Southeast Asia, the grassy stunt virus stuck. 
and uh, there was a threat that it would push back the gains from green revolution and uh, breeders uh, needed a source of resistance against the grass eastern virus and uh, uh, Dr. Kush was uh, by this time in position at ERI, and uh, he had a very uh, nice uh, coming from the rice cytogenetics and germplasm development group at California with Dr. C.M. Rick. He had a good idea of germplasm use, but they needed a stock for uh, grassy stunt virus resistant. Most of the cultivated materials were susceptible. Hmm. So, and then somewhere parallel to this activity, Dr. S.T. Sharma working at uh, CRRI as a botanist, you know, he had uh, already uh, forayed, must have forayed into many kinds of uh, uh, rice wild species. Uh, one of them, or probably the most important uh, in his work was these uh, about 6,723 accessions of rice anivara. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had collected these species from different uh, uh, East Indian uh, sites, particularly the Ganda district of Eastern UP. And uh, in fact, the, uh, the name of the species suggests um, uh, this is, uh, they had uh, Shastri and Sharma. Sharma was the student, uh, Dr. Shastri. And uh, I've given the reference here. They, they were the ones to identify, like Dr. Yadav was mentioning his uh, uh, species he had identified. So this was their uh, discovery uh, or mis taxonomically they had uh, finalized the, its, uh, uh, might, uh, its taxonomic uh, traits and attributes. So this is uh, what they had. And this had been shared uh, with Edie. And at ED, Dr. Kush and his entomologist, Dr. Ling, they carried out a very, very meticulous screening of this, the entire set of these accessions. And see the importance of uh, how um, is, uh, carefully this work needs to be done. Only one accession was resistant out of the 6,000. And Dr. Kosh and his colleagues, they used this succession to transfer resistance into the new varieties coming up and also the available varieties like IR8. And then around 1974, they had released this whole set of varieties. And then in 1975, uh, they released this IR36, which carried resistance from Raisa Nevara, grassy stunt resistance rules. And by virtue of carrying grassy stunt virus resistance and other resistances also, besides being early and well adapted, this variety spread out to 11 million hectares in Asia. And uh, this uh, became a record no other variety has been grown on such a wide scale in the history of plant breeding. And then this resistance also spilled over to other varieties. And this set of varieties, they covered about 74 million uh, hectares in, in the combined Indian subcontinent, China, Southeast Asia. So means you could see how a pre-breeding uh, kind of uh, phase dovetailed so well into the breeding uh, needs of that time. And this really became a classical example. And kudos to Dr. S.D. Sharma, who started this part. And I was lucky uh, to be attending a training like you are attending right now at NBTGR. And Dr. Sharma had uh, come over to deliver a lecture. And this was uh, one of my you may say, prized moments uh, in my uh, learning career uh, to listen to him. And then another story with Exit 21, many of you know this story. And this story starts uh, in Africa, in Mali, 
Of course, the species is distributed more widely into several African uh, countries in the African continent. And this is uh, from Raisa Rufi Poko. And uh, what's interesting is uh, those people who are more familiar with rice might know that each continent has a rice ancestor, but they are different from each other. Like Nivara is our part, and Rufi Pogon is a longest terminator, rather, is the part coming from Africa. There is Australian cis, and there are other species from other continents. And that's how we see that rice progenitors predated the continental shift. So these, these evolutionary patterns are really uh, very interesting. And uh, now that uh, we have access to germplasm from all over the world, we are bringing those relatives back into the pool. And that's uh, enhancing uh, our uh, probabilities and possibilities of improving rice. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, to cut start that long story, means do a series, series of steps. Uh, it means this resistance uh, shifted from Risa longest aminata to uh, some genetic stocks, then to uh, IR24, and then to other varieties. Then even the gene was cloned. And it was, uh, of course, before that, it was tagged. And uh, even the transgenic uh, got deployed in China. A transgenic restorer line became the parent of 20% of the uh, Chinese uh, hybrids at one point of time, right? And then, of course, you know the Indian story. Uh, all those who know about rice, this is one of the genes. And this has got, in the initial analysis, this was almost resistant to every isolate of uh, bacterial blight. Uh, pathogens and thermomas. So this is uh, such a, I mean, it's kind of a useful gene over so many uh, regions and locations. And now it is finding a lot of deployment in the Indian varieties, even the varieties released at BAU also, in pyramided along with some other useful genes like XA5, XA13, so XA21 is there and, and this is the point uh, you might need to uh, also look at is that it is a research of more than three decades, which brought us to this stage when the resistance could be widely deployed on the farmer's fields. So it's the kind of project uh, orientation you need to have. So uh, these days we are conducting short projects and of small tenure, three to five years. So we need to see how to link one with the other and keep pursuing a particular useful gene until it finds a useful deployment. So that's very important. Again, we have this uh, excellent case of male sterility. Now rice was never a good candidate for commercial hybrid varieties. But the Chinese, they found out a resistance source in uh, Ariza Skyva F spontaneous, which is a kind of, uh, I would say, a natural hybrid between Skyva and Rufi Pogon. And it is uh, found uh, in some of the, it was on the Hainan Island in this case, in some of the swamp areas it was growing. And because uh, the uh, means the female parent might have been Rufi Pogon and this Taiva would have been the male parent here and the sterility was there. Hmm? So Dr. Yuan Longping, you know him as the father of hybrid rice. So he, he discovered this and then the rest is as they say history. And uh, hybrids came to occupy at one point of time more than 50% of the rice area. And all of this at the back of this was this uh, sterilizing cytoplasm from Ariza spontaneous. Hmm? 
and uh, there are different estimates, very uh, convincing estimates, how much benefit uh, this uh, cytoplasm, uh, cytoplasmic gene, we might say, delivered to the first to the Chinese rice production. And then of course, uh, now we see that many rice growing countries, including India, uh, have uh, some component of hybrid rice and uh, all of them are still using this uh, cytoplasm. And then uh, by, by around the 19, mid 1990s, uh, the markers had come in and people were deploying markers in the, some of the wide hybridization work here also. And uh, a new concept emerged. One could also tap for hidden genes, particularly for, for productivity, because you know the uh, wild uh, accessions would not be productive as such. But the hypothesis was that they carry some productivity alleles at some of the loci, though overall the yield is poor. But if these alleles uh, they are identified and shifted to the cultivated uh, uh, species, it could lead to yield increase. And this uh, strategy had been developed uh, by Dr. Tanksley and his group, including Dr. McCouch, and then in uh, uh, collaboration with the Chinese partners, this was called ABQTL. They had improved the highest yielding rice hybrid that taken up, improved one of the parents of this hybrid using the ABQTL strategy and using Ariza Rufi Pogon as the donor to genes or QTLs for yield enhancement were identified on uh, from and transferred from Rufi Pogon to Ariza Staiva and then put into the hybrid background. So this, uh, one of them gave a yield increase of 18%, another 17%, something really um, amazing uh, if you see that uh, such quantum jumps in yield are not easy to observe. And together they at least, uh, uh, they could demonstrate that 50% yield increase uh, over the original hybrid. And this opened up an altogether new concept where QTLs for these kind of traits, which are for productivity traits, which are very important uh, for the breeding work, they could also be, uh, uh, rather because of diversity, it was seen that going to the, particularly to the progenitor species, same genome species, but a wider germplasm would allow uh, some new combinations for higher productivity. Uh, of course, with using the QTLs and trying to consolidate them together. And then similar story with one, though this is, a, 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 this was a spontaneous translocation. Now with wheat, uh, uh, unlike rice, the advantage is that it, it's a hexaploid. It can uh, carry a large segment from an alien donor without much of a problem. And this is a, an entire chromosome arm from Rai had settled into wheat variety Kavkaz, which was a Russian winter wheat variety. And when uh, in the 70s, 1970s, Mexico Simit, they started using winter wheat into spring wheat crosses for spring wheat improvement. Kavkaz was one of the parents that was used. And that wheat Rai translocation it passed on unknowingly to the wheat germplasm. It, the first set of germplasm developed from this was the Viri lines. And then they went on to give rise to selections like Attila and Cause. And we know them by uh, names that we gave them here in India, like PBW343, WH542. And this gave a quantum jump, a post 
uh, dwarf in gene quantum jump. Otherwise, uh, only incremental changes in yield were happening. So this could deliver almost uh, two quintals per acre across the board. And so this became a very significant uh, introgression. And uh, so much so that it came to uh, occupy, the 1B1 or translocation materials came to occupy 50% of all wheat area in the developing countries. But uh, incidentally, not in the developed world, because 1B1 or translocation is not preferred due to poor uh, bread making quality. But we are mostly eating chapatis and other kinds of traditional uh, uh, preparations, so no problems, no issues. Mm -hmm. So this is again a very... Okay, then I was just uh, trying not to miss out maize. Maize, uh, you might also see that uh, the pre-breeding work in the sense of wide hybridization and such things isn't kind of much called for, simply because uh, the level of diversity maize enjoys as a cross-pollinated crop. And today, to this day, it is still getting a lot of uh, genetic integration from TSNT, uh, fields growing around the maize in its center of origin areas, Mexico to Guatemala to the uh, further areas in uh, South America, uh, where, 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 rice, where maize was uh, originally domesticated, it is still having an open exchange with a lot of TSMT. Mm -hmm. And it is also housing a lot of uh, diversity already within its genome. Mm -hmm. So that way, but then, I think the most uh, striking or ambitious uh, uh, target that we that I came across for maize in the literature, and uh, that's what we used to always take up for study uh, with the students. That's uh, the apomictic behavior of tipsecum. Now, teosinte is the immediate progenitor, same number of chromosomes, easily crossable. And all that, though it took 50 years for people to agree that TOCNT is the maize progenitor. There were some controversies, some issues, some problems. That's another very interesting story, but keeping that aside. Hmm? Uh, Apomixis is available in another uh, maize relative tripsecum. 36 chromosomes in the diploid, 72 in the tetraploid. And this. Uh, this again had was a multi-decade project hmm? uh, in which even CIMET was interested at one point of time. They pursued it for about one decade, but uh, without final success. So this also is illustrative that you do not get success in every lead that's available. You have to pursue, and then you have to decide what to do with it. So this is, as far as I know, this apomixis gene transfer from tripsacum to maize did go quite far, but not far enough to deliver a commercial product out of that. So, and that's again another uh, very interesting uh, means when people went on to see the chromosomal and the molecular basis of this uh, apomictic behavior, many strange things came up. And uh, there was a kind of, it went across, not just, it was not just in uh, maize, but also in some uh, related, uh, the panicetum, stramulatum, and all uh, a set of species. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, so you can see, there's a, uh, means the impact that uh, pre-breeding has made uh, is huge. And sometimes we lose sight of that. We keep believing that it is still to show its uh, value. So means all I'm trying to tell here is that this has a lot of value. It has been well demonstrated. And uh, let me kind of uh, even go as far as uh, to say that there is no crop in the world 
which would have survived as a crop, as a viable crop, without some strategic genetic input uh, at some point of time from the exotic germplasm from the wild species and from sources which are a little kind of which get in, go into the pre-breeding domain. So that's happened for each and every crop. So let's not be, uh, think, though it happens in a longer cycle, but it's critical. It, it's something, uh, means I don't think uh, uh, the breeders should shy away from, even if the results are uh, not say as uh, predictable as they are, but they are bigger comparatively when they work, when, they, when it happens. So this brings me uh, to the PAU wheat breeding program. So what I was discussing, discussing here was something that is a matter that we often take up with the students uh, in the class. So let me also shift to some of the research uh, that uh, we did that we that is still uh, on We're going going pretty strong uh, at this center. And this is just one center. The other centers are no less, I believe. Many of them must be better, surely. And so this is illustration is uh, just you can see what one center can attempt, which means that all of you participating in different programs have have a similar uh, kind of opportunity and opening. So it is available. Uh, so I uh, miss just to kind of uh, uh, open up our minds to this. So that's uh, maybe the entire training has this objective. So I'm just trying to contribute in my little way here. So this is the wild uh, germplasm at PAU. And we had a good history. Dr. Gill was a wheat breeder, Dr. H.S. Dhaliwal. Uh, came in next, uh, who was a breeder and a biotechnologist. And these two people had a PL480 USDA project in which they collected germplasm from all over the world. And uh, we cannot thank them enough for this legacy they kind of uh, gave to the center. So this is again very important. Whatever phase you are in, everything counts. At that point of time, uh, they may not have delivered products as such, but they built, built up the germplasm, started so much, which later on uh, kind of um, blossomed into so many uh, new products. So this is uh, another feature that all of you who are going to be doing some pre-breeding work it is the handling of the wild materials and the exotic materials. That's very important. Learning to handle them, which is a little different from the regular species, from the cultured species. There would be like here I'm showing in this picture, on one side, the seedlings are being vernalized. And on the other a picture, if we are extending the photo period, for the wheat, uh, we are creating long days so that flowering is there. So this is fundamental to many situations that you would need a chilling because we are in a tropical and subtropical environment. And many of our species we are have working with, wheat, barley, gram even, they're coming from temperate zone or from high altitude areas. Uh, so there we need to create those conditions for them. And, and I see from experience, I've seen all those centers who learned to raise these materials, they succeeded in making the pre-breeding work happen. So this is a great prerequisite which you cannot uh, miss out. And then quickly to go how the wheat uh, uh, in progression goes. So you need to have a very good understanding of the genomes of the how they are related. In wheat, we have basically two situations. It is a hexaploid. And uh, we have a lot of species uh, in the wheat gene pool, in the primary gene pool rather, uh, we, who have the same genome as the three genomes of wheat. But the problem is that uh, wheat is a hexaploid. These species are at the diploid level. 
So it means the hexaploid diploid cross would throw up a lot of chromosomal imbalance and sterility. It's not possible generally. So most of the time to kind of bridge this gap, uh, they are using tetraploid species or sometimes in the durum meat, and mostly durum meat uh, as the bridging species. And then one cross with durum wheat and then the subsequent cross with the exploit wheat. So that works very well. And so this is, uh, but then this would not work for the D genome because the bridging species is AB, AABB tetrapoid, and the D genome is missing in that. So with the D genome, is the strategy has been the development of synthetic hexaploid weeds. So like I show here in the third bullet point, that it's the tetraploid wheat crossed with the diploid wild D genome donor, Agilops Doshai, which was earlier called Scorosa. You might have seen that name in the textbooks. So this is, you can make a hybrid, double the chromosome number, and some of this doubling also happens spontaneously, and you can get a hexaploid. Uh, synthetic hexaploid, because this hexaploid, it did not happen in nature. We created it in the field. Hmm? And then this synthetic hexaploid becomes a donor. And the ploidy level is same as the, the hexaploid wheat. So very easy, uh, no problems of hard threshing and other wild genes would be there. Uh, at one point of time, uh, we tried an alternative strategy also where we used Agilops toshai uh, directly with the bread wheat. And we found that this system was faster and uh, it, it had fewer steps and it could give us the advantage of uh, crossability across the board. With any Agilops toshai and any bread wheat, we could make this cross. Of course, the price to pay for this was, this required, uh, very careful embryo rescue and uh, the plant regeneration and uh, of course the chromosome doubling needed to be done. But uh, this was uh, a kind of, you could say, uh, a new technique as far as the uh, utilization. Agilops toshai is the probably the most diverse uh, species having adaptation in a very wide spectrum of eco-geographical zones. And this is the uh, kind of a primary tar donor target for us for biotic as well as abiotic stresses. So this is how we try to uh, kind of improve on the transfer system for this uh, materials. And uh, of course, uh, just to give you a feeling of how this goes, so this is the emasculation. As you look at the spike of Agilops toshai, and then of course pollination, we could all use a brush or we could use the other method that you go-go method. And of course, then it requires a lot of uh, growth regulator support, primarily too for the application to the florets. And then the caryopsis, they develop very well if you give the 2,4-D application. And some of the harvested caryopsis are there. The embryos can be rescued and the plants regenerated. The best part is that there is, a, a, whereas the synthetic making, you depend on a particular set of uh, durum parents and not all Tosha parents are very responsive. But here the things are, you could you be making any kind of cross. So from progenitor genomes, in wheat. Uh, early on, I had uh, come across a paper titled the Deepening of the Wheat Gene Pool. The wheat, you know, uh, is a very narrow based uh, species, uh, if, you, if we say genetically speaking, because a particular accession of uh, tetraploid wheat in a rare episode of hybridization with a particular D genome species got hybridized 
and spontaneously doubled in a rare event. And these events people are now calculating might be just one or two uh, in nature. And that was, and that, that, and it did not happen very, very long ago. It did not have evolutionary time on its side. This happened in a field of a farmer, actually, maybe some eight to 10,000 years ago, when uh, cultivation of these species, the tetraploid wheat species had started, and a wild uh, uh, D genome species was present uh, somewhere in the field. And so, from that very kind of single base, or just maybe a couple of more events, if uh, you, you might uh, like, the whole of the cultivated wheat germ, uh, gene pool, the cultivated wheat uh, varieties have come from this. So there was a huge pool of the wild species on the tetraploid side, on the uh, D genome side, on the A, B individual species side, which never got into the wheat gene uh, germ, uh, kind of improvement work. And it was, it should have been, it would be very easy to go and get more and more variation from here. Somehow the early work in wheat focused more on the non-progenitor species than on the progenitor species. The advantage of using progenitor species is you could get a lot of integrations, recombination was free. You could get integration for, for genes like quantitative genes for productivity, et cetera, where large number of uh, uh, loci need to be involved, large number of integrations need to be involved. Uh, but somehow because the work was largely driven by cytogeneticists and people interested in making new hybrids, which could be reported in the literature. So more focus was uh, on the non harder crosses, but uh, these harder crosses were not only hard to make, they were harder to utilize for breeding purposes. Because making the cross was one part, getting the chromosomes to translocate was the, actually the tougher part. So getting these uh, translocations always involved some special cytogenetic manipulations, the use of the pH locus, the use of radiation induced chromosomal breakages. And this was, uh, kind of, and then of course, the issue of a uh, lot of uh, uh, the, the undesirable genes coming along. So this is, uh, but then again, both have their value and both uh, sources uh, have proved to be of great use. And then uh, the wide hybridization work we have already also been using for doubled haploid production. Uh, the wheat into maize crosses is, uh, provides an excellent system of uh, doubled haploidy. And uh, uh, here at PAU, uh, the group is uh, regularly generating haploids from uh, doubled haploids from elite crosses. And of course, they're also using some other speed breeding innovations, but uh, this is uh, providing them a, an accelerated means of uh, 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 kind of arriving at the final product. And this is very important when it comes to the pre-breeding uh, kind of situation, because we are extending the breeding cycle beyond a normal duration, which we follow in the conventional uh, breeding. So this becomes uh, very important that we, you should also have a means of curtailing and hastening that process. Only then the breeder will be interested because uh, a breeder has a, also a particular tenure uh, which uh, he has to accomplish uh, uh, within that tenure, the targets of his uh, program. And then with the advent of markers, you know, the scenario for uh, uh, this pre-breeding changed, uh, I would say dramatically. The opportunities, uh, I mean, if these two things come together, one is uh, the ability to track the uh, genes of interest, 
and then the ability to accelerate the advancement of the materials. I think then pre-breeding pre does not become burdensome and the breeders uh, would not shy away from uh, using this very valuable um, strategy, which so far, I think uh, uh, most of the people have tried to stick to the conventional uh, approach, considering that the time involvement uh, is uh, too long for achieving the uh, required targets. I think so. this thing is now a matter, should be a matter of the past with proper infrastructure and proper investment. I think pre-breeding can deliver in, in, in a very reasonable time the products which are desired and it, it would greatly enhance the genetic improvement of any crop. So this is, uh, then we started a kind of uh, changing our approach a uh, little considering that uh, uh, markers are available and we could be generating uh, permanent introgression materials and not just with one target and then we can keep on looking at the variation there because you know the other part also had like with rice I mentioned that the hidden genes are also important and sometimes you know new traits keep coming up in breeding. Uh, we, we were not doing the breeding for uh, the micronutrient content. We were not doing breeding for N and P use efficiency earlier. And there are a lot of nutritional traits, which we were like the celiac allergy and other things, which we were not considering uh, in the earlier programs. So means it's always uh, would be useful to have the introgressions uh, in a systematic, and uh, we're covering the whole genome of the donor uh, in the development of these uh, integration lines. And so this is a kind of approach we followed with speltoides. Speltoides is the, mm, the B genome donor mm, or the S genome donor, like it is called. And in the durum, we could get a whole set of the introgrest segment lines in the background of, uh, from, Spaltoides in the background of durum wheat. And when the molecular markers showed us, we could get a set of lines which are having overlapping segments. And this is the one which my arrow is going along. If we are able to uh, fix, we take it to home, I like we did already, uh, then this. Uh, stores the entire spaltoides genome in the durum background, and this becomes a material for use in future. Yeah. Another important, I'm just giving you some examples, uh, because with the markers, the things are now much better. So this is a very useful gene. It started with the original people I mentioned working in the program 20, 25 years back, but it has now gone into varieties. Uh, 2017. So there was a huge time lag, but I think this is now getting compressed uh, uh, with all these techniques. So here the important part was this is these are two new genes, LR76, YR70, and uh, this, these were uh, we could show them to be new genes by virtue of the molecular positions, the chromosomal positions, and then. Using these uh, markers, we could also take up these genes for gene pyramiding in the varieties. And uh, of course, then uh, I mentioned that there are so many other traits and we are introgressing from D genome for iron and zinc. And uh, also there are some uh, diseases which have not been uh, uh, effectively taken care of with, from within the germ, uh, cultivated germplasm donors. So Kernalbund is one of them. And here we are using triticale for the improvement. And then there's a list of donors and traits and the chromosomal positions and the genes involved. So there is a uh, lot of uh, this uh, work has already been accomplished uh, all the way to the actual designation of the genes. 
and then further to the deployment of these genes. So this is uh, the PBW343, like we mentioned, was a mega variety, but it had become succumbed to the uh, yellow rust primarily in is at some point of time after standing in the farmer's fields for about 13 to 15 years. And then we were like interested in reviving it for its adaptation, for its preference by the farmers. So we put in all these genes together. So there are multiple genes could be introgressed using markers. And I hope you are able to see this here. Mm -hmm. uh, YR17 complex, YR40 LR57, or which is also known as YR, means it's, it's a allelic uh, version of the same gene. So these five genes we put together in 343, and we could immediately see the response coming from the farmers in the, the northern districts of the state where the yellow rust arrives and does more damage from the foothills, coming down from the foothills, the, this variety got preferred in those zones. So that's a very good uh, indication that uh, what we had tried to accomplish, uh, we are getting a uh, this kind of a good response from the growers. And encouraged by that, the, uh, the genes from these wild donors uh, particularly LR57, YR40, and LR76, YR70, along with pyramiding with some other available genes from other sources like YR15 and YR10. So these varieties have been released at the national level. And they are among the most resistant materials available in the entire set of the released varieties. Because this is... Uh, and of course, the, 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 at the national level, these varieties are attracting the seed indent also. So this is uh, just to tell you that. And then the work with rice has been as good. We have these two main parallel programs, though rice wheat now we are uh, at, at the level of the agricultural policy, thinking that we should uh, uh, kind of uh, withdraw a little from the such a overwhelming uh, acreage of uh, rice wheat in Punjab. But nevertheless, it, these are the two main crops for us. And uh, for rice, the work has been equally rewarding when it comes to the wild species. Of course, uh, like I mentioned, that uh, it would be another, uh, it would take another session actually uh, to cover rice. And some of the work in rice is uh, I think it, it kind of even goes beyond what has been a, achieved uh, in wheat. Here also we have the released varieties with these genes. And uh, we have even this uh, particular novel genes like from Rhiza glabrima, we have a variety called PR127. Basically it is Pusa 44, but its early variant was chosen and then with this gene. Mm -hmm. Similarly, this, these, are, these are genes which were identified in-house. These are genes which are coming from our germplasm sharing and legacy of other programs, right? So, and uh, yeah, this is another gene on which PAU contributed. BPH is very important. And uh, we are trying to move to basmati in preference to the, uh, the, the standard rice varieties. So there, this is going to be of major use. And then uh, we are also now moving to the aerobic kind of rice. And there's a whole lot of uh, pre-breeding work and introduction work to be done there for a full set of traits. See, here we are trying to change the very adaptation of a species. Rice, as we understood, uh, required standing water. But we are trying to take that requirement away from rice and still be able to use it for our food security purposes without uh, unduly 
depleting our natural resource, which is groundwater. So th this is this kind of uh, mega uh, kind of project. Many centers are participating. The ERI Center at, under Dr. Arvind at Varanasi, now he shifted to Trisat actually. Uh, that took lead in this, and uh, we got a very good germplasm set from his program. And we are trying to put all this together to create a new type of rice and uh, within a very short time frame. And some of these lines are actually already uh, being tested at an initial level. So this, is, uh, this has become possible. So means, uh, just to indicate that pre-breeding work uh, has become possible uh, to this extent that you could be a kind of uh, targeting the very adaptation, natural adaptation of a crop and trying to make it more, tailor it uh, to the requirements of a particular region. So, but of course, all these sporting accelerated breeding systems have to be in place if you want the results to materialize within uh, uh, the, because every need has a time frame and uh, every requirement, so means this has to be. So this is, uh, I think, this sport has brought pre-breeding into the domain of uh, you know, almost the regular breeding work. And of course, uh, must not forget that this is teamwork, and uh, this is this is a means. These statues are enacting a scene from a, a rural area where they are cooking chapatis in, in a community tandoor. Yeah. So thank you very much for your listening. And if there are any questions or any points for discussion, I would be happy to participate. So over to Dr. Ravi and uh, Dr. Jyoti, whoever is handling this. Uh, sir, yes, sir. Sir, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, dear participants, if you have any doubts or suggestions or anything. Bhumi, hey Bhumi, a blue color pen, no, please. So, please, dear participants. Uh, sir, uh, one of you in the chat box, sir, actually one question is in. What mm -hmm. is the basic criteria to select a parent for making a cross in wheat? Is it, is it the means for a but it, it has it goes with the breeding objective no uh, yes it's the trait it's the trait of interest yes. so means the criteria is very simple yes. uh, if the trait of interest is available in the primary gene pool then we are comfortable with that but if the trait of interest is not there and we have to look further afar then of course we use those, whatever those techniques, wide hybridization, everything to bring that trait in. So the choice is, uh, you might say, driven by the needs of the program. Hmm? So there's no other way to choose. We are not making crosses for some, in uh, as part of the breeding process, we are not making crosses just for some, uh, some academic uh, questions, of course. On the margins, some of that can also happen. Hmm? Sir, and another question is uh, from Dr. Sheetal Patel, Navasari Agricultural University. Yes. Uh, sir, we, do we have wild germplasm for direct seeded in rice crop? Uh, actually, yes. Lot of uh, aerobic behavior is uh, coming from uh, the related species. But most of them, I understand, are age norm species only, they are crossable. And large number of QTLs are already in the rice background now. Yes. The question is to consolidate these QTLs with minimum uh, linkage drag and with minimum adverse effects of the these genes coming in. Particularly right now, we are more concerned about quality because rice uh, goes for milling, industrial milling. And uh, millers are very uh, kind of stringent about quality. 
So we are going to DSR. The DSR conditions themselves are not very favorable for the grain quality, the breakage, et cetera, is a little higher. And we're also afraid some chalkiness or other things can come in. Hmm? Uh, but otherwise, these QTLs are abundantly, there are more than 20 QTLs from diverse sources, which are now rolling into the cultivated backgrounds, and they are accessible. They are from the public programs, they're accessible. If anybody's interested, I think let them contact the Varanasi program, uh, the ERI uh, license office uh, there, and the India ERI center is there. Or, and they, they have a major focus on DSR. And of course, PAU also has the materials and uh, they are also ready to share. And um, Jyoti ma'am, and sir, uh, another question from sir, Dr. P. Gonya Nayak from mm -hmm. PJTSU Hyderabad. Mm -hmm. uh, any popular variety suitable for direct seeded rice for short duration under long slender segment? Uh, right now means at uh, in this zone, uh, most of the basmati varieties are suitable. It means that is, but if it is in the parmal rice, I think he's asking for the parmal long slender types, PR126, that's uh, an excellent variety for growing under the DSR conditions. And we are mostly looking for short duration varieties in case of, and this is one variety, which has, ha has the shortest duration, just 93 days from uh, transplanting to maturity, even in the North Indian conditions, right? Mm. So this is, uh, but the, uh, what I might also add here is that these are varieties chosen from the larger set of conventional varieties. So far, we do not have a variety in this uh, zone at least. I understand there are in this uh, eastern zone there are, in the southern zone there are, which have been specifically developed for the DSR conditions. And that material is a, a, about a couple of two, three years down the line that would be available. Mm. Uh, sir, there is a question from Dr. Yadav also. Yes, sir, Yadav, sir. Yes. He's uh, our speaker, sir, actually, earlier speaker, sir. previous speaker. Earlier speaker, sir. Uh, he also yes. talked about uh, pre-breeding on uh, <clears throat> Kukumis, Bhigna, and those species. So yes. he's asking that there are some perennial oryza species. Are they used in breeding program? Perennial oryza species. Yeah, perennial, uh, there is a oryza pogon, which is perennial rice. Uh, but uh, it, there, was a, there was a long-standing program at ED where they had tried to use the perennial rice. But in most of the agroecologies, perennial rice is not to be preferred. See, for the Northern Indian conditions where the winter sets in, the perennial rice will not survive. And you cannot keep it there in the field for one season, where when you are looking for another crop, say wheat or brassica or gram in our case, and it was, uh, I found that this was useful only in some uh, upland areas, mountainous areas, where it, they are being maintained, these clumps are being maintained permanently, and uh, it could be of some use there. So very limited uh, utility is there actually for perennial rice. Otherwise also uh, means we, in the agricultural, intensive agricultural situation, we do not want to, carry forward the same materials because the diseases and pests are going to build up there. Hmm? So it, it is only in a kind of a, a little of a, uh, I mean, different terrain and agroforestry kind of situation where perennial rice can fit in. So that's a, another, a, or different mode of agriculture altogether actually. Hmm. So it doesn't really fit in with the, the modern agricultural practices in any of the zones. Uh, sir, hello. Uh, yeah, yes, please. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, this uh, Oriza Mariana variety granulata, which I have seen in South India, it is a perennial grass, you know, yeah. grows yeah, in yeah. forest ecosystem. Yeah, so yeah, whether, yeah. Uh, I mean, some, some germ uh, genes, okay, 
will be of our significance whether that has been used in breeding program this is what it has uh, yeah i don't think it has been used for this trait uh, uh, though it has right. been used this is not a uh, very highly prioritized trait for any of the regular agroecologies so that's what i was mentioning mm. though mariana is little distant all these uh, uh, species which are not age known uh, there, the initial cross is a little difficult. Often, embryo rescue is required, and uh, you are having the unreduced gametes. The most of the the crosses only succeed uh, with the result of unreduced gametes produced by the F1. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, true for Mariana and true for the officinalis complex also. Only the Stiva complex is we are able to get a direct transfer. But anyway, the prenality is there, and there are some very esoteric groups who are advocating permaculture. Hmm? But uh, considering the Indian uh, agricultural situation and the population pressure, uh, one doesn't really see it as a very promising approach. And, uh... So, uh, if participants uh, have further any questions or doubt, so uh, they can contact you, sir. They can write uh, email to sir, and we will be giving all the contact details of the resource persons to all the participants. Yeah, most, most, most welcome. Please do. Uh, so, uh, so if uh, there is no questions, so I would like to uh, thank uh, to sir. So, sir, uh, on behalf of NBPGR and all the organizing team of this tra virtual training program. I would like to thank you, sir, for this uh, really excellent uh, talk, sir, about the pre-breeding aspect. You have led the means pre-breeding. PAU is well known for the PAU program, pre-breeding pre program at PAU. And uh, you are the great leader for that program, sir, which has given so many products of varieties and genetic stocks and those things. Most of them are uh, available in Gen, uh, Gene Bank at the NBPGR, sir. They have been posted here. So uh, the all wheat group, sir, wheat fraternity group is very much thankful to sir your all efforts, and they will be always thankful to you, sir. So thank you very much, sir, for your all the uh, knowledge enhancing words. Certainly, these all words might have given think tank ideas to all the participants. Uh, actually, most of them are early career scientists, more than 50%. So they will certainly might have received a separate idea for doing their research program in their career. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for people on the organizing side and the participants also. Thank you very much. Namaskar, sir. Namaskar. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Yes, sir. Uh, Shilia, ma'am, uh, dear participants, our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Shilia Chalam. She joined. The class will start from uh, 12.15. Please be in online just for uh, two minutes. Our next speaker is also joining. In, uh... 
yes uh, welcome ma'am shilia ma'am uh. yeah yeah good morning uh, yes ma'am yes okay uh, now let me introduce uh, dear trainees our uh, next speaker and she is uh, dr v shiriya chalam she is uh, currently working as a principal scientist and she is uh, ex head in the division of plant quarantine icr and bpgr new delhi and she is having more than 29 years of research experience especially in plant quarantine diagnostics of plant viruses and policy issues related to biosecurity and biosafety and uh, she done a extensive work on uh, 45 viruses including 19 exotic pests are intercepted in imported germplasm including transgenics and uh, how it may be we have to uh, stop the in uh, entry of into india and she she spent uh, two deputations at washington state university and uh, oklahoma state university uscn and she is a visiting faculty for uh, uh, mordoch university australia and uh, she is uh, for reviewing the strategies for sampling and certification of uh, living modified organisms and uh, she is a recipient of uh, dr prasadra memorial award uh, for the 2012 and she is a fellow of indian society of pgr and fellow of uh, indian phytopathological society and she is a member of potivide study group international committee for taxonomy of viruses and she published more than uh, 75 research papers and has a co-authored or other five books technical manuals Uh, book chapters and lot of uh, international uh, reputed papers and she participated in international conferences and she delivered them more than 100 lectures in the training programs and madam uh, on behalf of training program and on behalf of organizing persons on all the, from the members i am welcoming you ma'am uh, and uh, this is ma'am uh, nearly 84 participants are there from different organizations uh, from 18 institutes and please ma'am being expertise in your field kindly share your knowledge and uh, the procedures and uh, methods or any other things uh, on regarding indian plant quarantine system please ma'am and dayas is yours ma'am welcome ma'am welcome thank you thank you dr ravi uh, let me share the screen Ma'am, it is uh, not in presentation mode, ma'am. Yeah, I am doing it. Ah, yes, yes. Yeah. Ah, yes, ma'am. Could you see? Ah, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You indicate me if I am exceeding my time. Okay. Ah, no, ma'am. Now up to lunch, uh, you have sufficient time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ah, yes, yes. No, to. Up... Ah, yes. Sir. You can continue up to two o'clock, Kal Sabha. It's not this <laughs> time. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Ah, yes, yes. Board. <laughs> Uh, yes ma'am sure dr ravi yes and uh, at the outset i would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak on national plant quarantine system and um, i would the structure of presentation would be i'll give brief introduction and then i will talk about international regulatory framework national regulatory framework on import quarantine export quarantine and i'll give examples of how the biosecurity system works in other countries and uh, way forward of course and why do we talk about quarantine because there is a transboundary movement of planting material either it is a commercial material you can see on the screen whether it is through the sea cargo or air cargo or road like amritsar waga border how the material comes from pakistan through the road even from afghanistan and from bangladesh you have west bengal border and through the train and this carries the inherent risk of pests and insect pests and pathogens and also the germplasm which comes as a small samples i'm sure most of you are the scientists or assistant associate professors must be importing the germplasm and it can be seeds it can be rooted material it can be cuttings it can be in vitro cultures everything has the inherent risk of carrying the pests when we were students almost 30 years back 
pests is used only for insect pests but now international plant protection convention rome pest includes insects mites fungi bacteria viruses nematodes rickettsia like organisms prions and even the weeds so in my talk if i am saving pest pest is all the insects and insect pests and pathogens and weeds and because there is an exchange of material either the germplasm or the um, commercial material and there is a transboundary spread of pests you can see here this is the best example if you are a pathologist or even an agriculture graduate you must have read about irish the famous irish famine this is the ireland and this potato leaf blight phytophthora infestans has gone from central america to ireland and uh, those days there were no refrigerators and potatoes used to be stored in the pit dig a pit and then uh, cover it and when they have taken out they found all the potatoes were rotten because of this pathogen and this was actually gone from central america to ireland and many people 1 million people died of hunger and 1 million people emigrated to north america and even the grapes pottery mildew downy mildew they have gone from north america to france and the entire wine industry has collapsed due to this pathogens and coffee berry borer now we have it in india but it has actually gone from south america to africa and from africa it has come to sri lanka and then it has gone to india and this is all because of we have the material moving from one country to another country because the pests don't need a passport and visa like us and they just come and this is the recent outbreak um, you must have read in newspapers um, bangladesh this wheat blast was wheat blast rice blast is there in india everywhere but wheat blast is not there in our country and also in bangladesh and in this outbreak is correlated with the series of grain imports from brazil this part of the world from latin american country it has gone to bangladesh how because of the imports so the what the indian government has done is import of wheat from bangladesh and latin american countries is prohibited and this is a uh, one example of one second let me close this hi yeah this is the introduction of banana bunchy top virus into india from sri lanka and now you see this virus everywhere why because the india has not eradicated this virus and now the dbt government of india is spending crores of rupees to give the farmers the virus free true to type tissue culture material but this is one of the successful programs in india i will talk about it little bit and the certified planting material is given to the farmers but this is an introduced virus you must be wondering then if there are uh, there are some other examples also recent one fall army worm and there are other examples you might be telling then why do we talk about quarantine see all these are unintentional introductions and still india is free from several pests more than 1000 pests are regulated pests if there is no quarantine these would have been introduced into the country and you see insect pests more than 500 viruses more than 250 and fungi more than 250 and even the weeds they are regulated pests for india these are not there and to ensure plant biosecurity what we need what is biosecurity biosecurity is the holistic approach to see that a particular region or country is free from pests and their harmful effects so how do we ensure the plant biosecurity through the regulations one is plant quarantine that is my topic and plant quarantine is again international quarantine and then domestic quarantine and you have regulations but if i you want been pod mortal virus do not come into india from usa you have have the regulations but if you don't have the diagnostics to detect that virus in the sample then you cannot ensure the biosecurity so regulations are important diagnostics are important 
and there are phytosanitary treatments. If you are an entomologist, if you you must have heard about irradiation, hot air treatment, hot water treatments. These are all to disinfect or disinfect the material. And these are all internationally approved, validated treatments. And if you see the plant quarantine order, methyl bromide fumigation is recommended for insects. And hot water treatment is recommended for pathogens in rice. And okay, you have the regulations, you have the diagnostics, you have the phytosanitary treatment, but awareness among researchers is very, very important. And um, in India, the search and seize powers are with the customs in the, uh, you must have seen if you are coming from overseas, you, will, you won't see quarantine officials at the airport counters, but you see the customs. So the awareness among the customs also is very, very important. And you have all this, but if you don't have an infrastructure, you don't have the expertise, then it is a, you cannot ensure the biosecurity. So to ensure biosecurity, you need all of this. And how do we prevent the entry of pests, that plant quarantine? It is all activities designed to prevent the introduction and if introduced, prevent its spread and to ensure their official control. How do you prevent its spread? You will cordon off the area. Like you have seen in a coronavirus, people were put in uh, isolation and also the police used to sit in front of the houses in uh, Delhi. So that is you cordon off the area. So you will prevent the spread of the quarantine pest. And official control is like, uh, yeah, uh, there were times when coronavirus was there, the flights were stopped and then um, screening was done when people are coming from China or uh, similar countries, even now. So that is the official control. In case of plant pests, um, one example is um, you have official control for golden system nematode of potato. It is there in uh, Tamil Nadu. Now it is reported from Himachal Pradesh. So from those states, the potato cannot be taken out. Even I was talking to one of the scientists, they are even facing the problems by not bringing the potato into the, from hills to the dump. So that is the official control. So uh, when you talk about what is a quarantine pest, it should meet the three criteria, a pest of potential economic importance to the area endangered, endangered is favorable, not at present, are if present, but not widely distributed. Again, the example you can take um, golden cyst nematode. And then not reported from India, for example, I'm a virologist basically. So pardon me if I take more examples of viruses. Uh, tomato ringu spot virus not reported from India. That is a quarantine test. And the role of plant quarantine is you, to prevent its entry, new pests through imports, and also the survey surveillance for any new pest outbreak. How do you find the new pest is there or not by doing the continually doing the survey, that is surveillance. And in, in turn, it will facilitate the safe trade of plant material and also it boosts the exports and uh, phytosanitary certification. Phytosanitary certificate is given the material which is going out from the country. The material is going into USA from India, India needs to give the phytosanitary certificate that this consignment is free from so and so pests as per the requirement of USA and to carry out import pest risk analysis, PRA. And uh, this, uh, if you um, talk about the international regulatory framework, there is an agreement and application of sanitary and phytosanitary measures that is SPS in general, uh, the jargon is used. Sanitary is looks into the health of the human beings and animals. Phytosanitary is plant health. So there are three sister organizations. Don't ask me why they are called three sisters, no, not three brothers. And one is for food safety, Codex Elementarius Commission and animal health. There is World Organization for Animal Health and for plant health, IPPC, International Plant Protection Convention in Rome. These are the three sister organizations deals with the sanitary and phytosanitary measures. 
and there are about uh, 47 international standards for phytosanitary measures and i have not listed all of them if you are a pgr student then because in the class we teach all 47 ispms and uh, there are uh, ispms i mentioned only few which deals with the how to conduct the pest risk analysis how to develop the diagnostic protocols what is the sampling method like metric tons of material comes as a commercial material you cannot test the entire truck you need to collect the samples what are the methodologies and how to have the postetry quarantine stations and um, the last one is audit in the photosanitary context if you just type international standards for photosanitary measures you will have all the pdf files of ispms and there are regional plant protection organizations these are advisory only there is no legal binding like uh, you, whether it is in um, asia pacific asia pacific has two organizations one is asia pacific plant protection commission based in thailand and one in uh, fiji pacific plant protection organization and for no north america you have napo which is in canada and for africa you have the inter african photosanitary council in cameroon and for the eu you have the european union and mediterranean like region wise there are uh, plant protection organizations and they do contribute in quarantine of that region like for example eu is the best like ipo has a1 a2 pest list a1 pest list is that pest is not there in the entire europe and a2 pest is it is there in one country but not in the other region like there are 28 29 uh, countries in the eu so they have the a1 a2 pest list like similarly if you look at india pakistan bangladesh and all these laos bangkok thailand china they all have the contiguous land borders but we don't have this a1 a2 pest list and there is a provision of third country quarantine for safe movement of plant genetic resources germplasm to particularly helpful for transferring high risk tropical subtropical plant genera from one country to another like material can be grown and tested in a temperate country without much risk if you are bringing the material from tropical region so the possibility of the survival of that pest in the temperate country is less for example university of reading uk does the quarantine for groundnut and cocoa if you are getting the material from usa groundnut groundnut is grown very much there the usa also has temperate subtropical tropical climates so instead of bringing directly to india because that pathogen or insect uh, virus may survive and uh, get introduced into india so the germplasm can be grown in university of reading uk because the chances of establishment of the pathogen in temperate countries is less similarly cassava a third country quarantine for pgr is available in torino italy and for banana it is in france these are the provisions available and if you look at the national legislation we have the more than 100 year old destructive insects and pest act 1914 this is during the britishers time but don't think that this act is very old act is old but uh, under the act all of you must be knowing that there are orders comes up regularly so under this order plants fruits and seeds order in 1984 to facilitate the import of material for the farmers and then new policy and seed development came in 1988 and there are only 14 crops in the pfs order 1984 so the pfs order was revised in 1989 and we have world trade organization in 1995 under which the sanitary and photosanitary agreement was inducted and to comply with this, the India has brought out plant quarantine order 2003. Again, you might be thinking it is again 20 year old. Yes, it is 20 year old, but under this amendments come. Suppose if the crop is not mentioned in the PQ order, then the risk analysis should be done and then it should be gadget notified and amendment is brought out. So in these 20 years, you have almost 100 amendments. That means every year at least on an average five amendments are being brought out 
And uh, in India, it is a two-tier system. The commercial material is quarantined by Directorate of Plant Protection, Quarantine and Storage under Department of Agriculture, Cooperation and Farmers Welfare. And the germplasm is quarantined by NBPGR. And again, NBPGR has uh, headquartered at New Delhi and Hyderabad station is done, does the quarantine for material imported for southern part of the country and also the ex material exported from ICRISAT. And uh, under DPPQS, you have a total 73 plant quarantine stations and out of which seven are regional plant quarantine stations. Bangalore and Kandla are added recently. And out of these seven, Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, Chennai, Amritsar, Bangalore, the material of commercial material for planting purpose, not for consumption. Planting purpose can only come through these six regional plant quarantine stations. And the rest of the plant quarantine stations and Kandla, the commercial material for consumption can come. For example, if you are from Andhra Pradesh, there is a quarantine station at Kakinada. If you are from Karnataka, there is a station at Mangalore. I'm just giving an example. So across the country, you have the stations and uh, notified points of entry are 311. It can be seaport, airport, land custom, inland container depots, foreign post offices, and there are 198 photosanitary certificate issuing authorities. And apart from uh, plant quarantine stations, even the head of the divisions of uh, ICR institutes and uh, state agriculture universities, head plant pathology, they are also authorized to give the photosanitary certificate to help the DPPQs to handle the commercial material. But for germplasm, only NBPGR, uh, the material comes to Delhi and from here, the material is dispatched to Hyderabad if it is for southern part of the country. And there are various schedules under PQ order. I think uh, Dr. Vandana must have taken, talked about it, but I will talk from quarantine angle. Schedule four is the where the material is prohibited for import. For example, banana rhizome suckers are prohibited from Central and South America, Hawaii, Philippines, and Cameroon due to moco wilt, uh, bacteria, race two, and phytoplasma. And there are 15 crops prohibited from different sources. Like the latest is wheat prohibited from Latin American countries and Bangladesh from, because of the wheat blast. And schedule five has again uh, 17 crops. And uh, it is schedule five one is you have the additional declaration for various pests. And also the, whether it is required to grow in the post-entry quarantine, for example, cassava for one year. And it is required subject to the recommendation of the crop-based institutes director. Banana, for example, NRC banana. And then schedule six has additional declarations and also the special conditions of import. For example, apple, pear, they have to be grown in post-entry quarantine for a period of one to two years. And they have to be free from all these insect pests and pathogens. And as I said, they all amendments come from time to time. In this case, Greece was not included. So the amendment has come in the year 2019 and Serbia was not there. So there is an amendment for Serbia. And there is a provision for post-entry quarantine. And this is stipulated for plant propagative material like horticultural crops. And there are 222 crops are stipulated with post-entry quarantine period under Schedule 6 of PQ order 2003, because this planting material is considered as high risk. Like in case of uh, apple, it is one to two years, but the inspection is for four times every quarter. And these are some of the post-entry quarantine periods ranging from one year to five years or one growth season. Like uh, in case of coconut, it is five years because the symptom expression by viroids is, comes very late. And uh, in case of banana, one year and apple, it is one to two years. There are many 222 crops, but I'm just giving you one example. And when you go for post-entry quarantine growing, you should give the undertaking. It is a provisional release. It is not a complete release. 
you should give the undertaking that it will be grown in isolation and uh, the scientists of NDPGR, whether it is Hyderabad or Delhi, they will go and inspect, collect the samples. And to grow the material in post-entry quarantine, you need to fill the application in PQ Form 18. Mention whether it is a poly house or uh, whether it is an open field and for which crop and the duration is also, it can be two years or it can be six months, but maximum two years and you have to apply again. And the PQ Form 19, in this format, the, um, you will get the certificate of approval of post-entry quarantine facility. And here there are uh, 45 inspection authorities. And the latest one is along with the inspection authority that is head plant pathology, division of plant pathology in different SAUs and ICR institutes. I'll show you the list. And then one plant protection officer from directorate of plant protection, quarantine and storage inspects. Earlier only the uh, head plant pathology, but now the plant protection officer also it is a joint inspection for certification and also for inspection. And these are the list of inspection authorities in different states. If you are from Bihar, you have the uh, Rajendra Agriculture University head plant pathology and Karnataka, you have Dharwad. And Karnataka has three actually. And Divisional Plant Pathology, US yes, Bangalore, and then uh, Dharwad, and also IIHR, Bangalore, last one. And there are three inspection authorities for tissue culture raised plants, IARI, IHBT, and uh, IIHR, Bangalore. And there is a standard operating procedure for post-entry quarantine inspection. If any one of you is um, part of this inspection, please go through this and also respect the procedure. If you are a breeder and if you are importing the material, please grow them in the approved post-entry quarantine facility. And it can be closed facility like a poly house with double door entry and then 40 to 60 mesh net. It should be insect proof. All of you know that if there are viruses, viruses has vectors and they will spread the viral disease. And um, it can be open facility also, but the isolation distance is 500 to 8. Thousand meters. Suppose if you are importing wheat germ plasm, there shouldn't be any wheat indigenous one grown around. Why? Because if there is an exotic pest that can go and get established there. And for export of commercial material, like you need to take the permission from export import committee, and then um, there are 198 photosanitary certificate issuing authorities. And this is required only for oil seeds, cereals, pulses, fodder seeds, and plants. And uh, ornamental plants and vegetable seeds, flower crop seeds do not require the exim permission. And then there are uh, national standards for phytosanitary measures. You can go through them later because, and uh, these are in line with the international standards for phytosanitary measures. There are 47 ISPMs, if you remember. And um, India government also has developed the NSPMs, Directorate of Plant Production Quarantine Storage. Germplasm, we uh, do the um, germplasm quarantine. We are empowered by the ministry. So, but the rest for India, the National Plant Protection Organization is not NBPGR, it is Directorate of Plant Protection Quarantine and Storage. And it is a two type, one for commercial and one for germ. So all these NSPMs are developed by Directorate of Plant Protection, Quarantine and Storage. And many of them are for fruit flies, you can see here, and also the mango nut weevil, potato, all that. And then um, Directorate of Plant Protection, Quarantine and Storage has also developed the standard operating procedures. Uh, SOP for export inspection. This manual is very good and you can get the idea of how the sampling is also done from truckloads of material. And um, there are SOPs for fresh vegetables and fruits and for export of rice to USA. And um, peanut, dried chilies. Dried chilies, all of you know that they have the aflatoxins problems and rice also, you have the insect problems. If you are a rice eater like me, you see those beetles in the rice, that papra beetle, they don't have it in USA, so it is a quarantine pest for them. 
And then there are SOPs for import inspection and clearance and also post-entry quarantine inspection. And there are phytosanitary treatments providers. These are all the phytosanitary treatments, methyl bromide fumigation, aluminum phosphide, because and the forced hot air treatment, hot water treatment, irradiation, vapor heat treatment. These are all uh, accredited providers by NPPO. And um, for example, like there is a provision, like if you want to import, you can go to the exporting country and see their facilities. And if they are as per your requirement, you can import. So the from Japan people, the experts come and inspect the these phytosanitary treatment facilities for uh, mango vapor heat treatment, and then only they import the material. And this is uh, just to give a idea, like in one year, how much material has been imported. So many metric tons of material. This is the commercial material. And with this, I'm completing one part of my lecture that is uh, how the national plant quarantine system works for commercial material. And um, yeah, there does everything online. Um, and there is a domestic quarantine also in India, but it is not a very successful story except for uh, golden system nematode of potato. And these are the nine pests. This needs to be reviewed. Since I was given the topic of national plant quarantine system, I thought I'll show you both international and um, internal quarantine. And this is related second part of my talk, like how the germplasm quarantine is done. And um, I'm sure like uh, all of you are interested to know about this. And um, it is the Nodal Institute for give, issue the import permit, quarantine processing and issue of phytosanitary certificate for export germplasm, including transgenics and uh, exchange. And transgenic germplasm is quarantined only at uh, Delhi. And this is the con containment facility we have here with high efficiency particulate air filters so that no pollen goes outside and also the pests and pathogens. And the material is grown and then it is tested for exotic pests and then destroyed carefully because of the biosafety issues involved. And uh, non-transgenics, of course, we do it in the quarantine labs. And what we do is we have the plant quarantine order for the regulated pest list. And this is the Bhagavad Gita, Quran and Bible for us. Apart from this, we have brought out edited volumes, potential quarantine pests for India and cereals, grain legumes, edible oil seeds, and tropical and subtropical fruit crops. So that in, uh, and also other resources, Crop Protection Compendium of CAB International, United Kingdom is a very, very helpful resource to do. If there is any crop which is not mentioned in the PQ order, we need to do the risk analysis. Naturally, germplasm, many people ask for the germplasm of the crop not mentioned in the PQ order, then we undertake the best risk analysis. This is, for example, edited volume. If the grapes is coming from Slovakia, Slovakia, is, if it is not mentioned in the PQ order, but we have the edited volume, and we would know that grapevine cyrovirus can come along with the grapes or uh, vegetative propagator. So this is just a screenshot how the edited volumes looks like. And also there is a, um, I already mentioned, if crop is not mentioned in PQ order, then all the entomologists, pathologists, bacteriologists, virologists, nematologists, and weed scientists do the risk analysis. And then we um, mention the pests, what are the additional declarations required. And if it is a virus, then we'll ask for the post-entry quarantine period. And um, there are some issues like um, in recent times, most of the USDA is asking for waiver for additional declarations and import permit. And um, we do the risk analysis. And if we have diagnostics completely, then we are giving the waiver. But as far as possible, please do get the additional declarations included in the photosanitary certificate. 
and quarantine processing of uh, exotic germplasm for transgenics you need the rcgm clearance and then uh, through the ibsc and then non transgenics it is not required and then you need to apply to nbpgr for import permit and then material is received with import permit and phytosanitary certificate from the exporting country and then it is jointly inspected and then it will go to the different labs and then wherever disinfestation disinfection treatments are required we do that and transgenics are grown in a containment facility and tested for embryogenesis deactivator gene tomorrow at evening i think you have afternoon dr monica singh would be taking the practicals and then if everything is pest free condition then only it is released to the end enter if there is no salvaging technique there is no disinfestation treatment that disinfection treatment available and if there is an exotic uh, pathogen or pest then the material is rejected and then we have an incinerator and it is incinerated and this is how the import permit looks this particular consignment is from usa uh, kukumis melo and 176 lines were received and um, our requirement is it should be free from bacteria and viruses and then depending on this additional declarations list the phytosanitary certificate is given by the usda this is a sample of how phytosanitary certificate looks like and then the samples are uh, here actually for you nbpgr is one but we have germplasm exchange unit samples goes there and they will uh, make the end form like this import clearance uh, quarantine clearance and then the material comes to quarantine division but exchange unit does not open the do not open the sample boxes it is opened here only and we maintain the both the soft copy and also the hard copy we have import quarantine register and the samples are entered like what is the import quarantine number which country and which crop and who is the inventor and how many samples whether any treatment is given and then when it is released release date also you see so once the material comes the material is inspected by entomologists fungal pathologists bacteriologists virologists dermatologists and weed scientists and all these symptomatic or if there are any holes or any soil all these de deformed seeds are removed during joint inspection in quarantine if you do this joint inspection carefully the visual examination more than 50% of the quarantine is done because you all these sources of inoculum and this is how the each and every sample is inspected here and this is a um, almond avocado from australia and like this mottling and soybean this indicates that the soybean seeds are harvested from mother plant which is infected by viruses and these symptoms can be due to soybean mosaic virus reported from india or bean pod mottle virus not reported. and then uh, soybean downy mildew not reported from india and then ergots and then soil clot you all of you know that soil carries the nematodes and then weeds uh, everything is removed and then these samples go for uh, individual labs and entomology has a very good ex real time x ray these samples look uh, seeds which look absolutely healthy but when they are exposed to x rays you can see the dots here these are all infested seeds and then they are retrieved and identified and also there is one more site transparency test on 15th you have practical so you will see all of this and we use the molecular techniques also and these are some of the insects which were intercepted and uh, yeah some more mites scale insects and then uh, cotton boll weevil anthonomus grandis in remember destructive insect pest act 1914 that act was implemented because then british government uh, doesn't want the this cotton boll we will introduce from mexico that time we were importing lot of cotton bales 
even now, as, uh, even after 100 years, this pest has not entered the country because of stringent quarantine. And then this is the uh, techniques used for detection and identification of fungi and bacteria in imported germplasm. We use both um, conventional techniques and also molecular techniques like uh, loop mediated isothermal amplification, multiplex PCR, and these are some of the just an example of fungi what we have intercepted. These are not reported from India. And uh, nematodes, um, these are the techniques um, like sieving and identification under the microscope and also the molecular techniques we use. And you will see them, all of them to, on 15th practicals. And these are the techniques for viruses and uh, these all these seeds you can see the mottling and also this is broad bean uh, necrosis due to broad bean stain virus not reported from India tennis ball like symptoms on peas and split seed core symptoms on pea these are due to pea seed bone mosaic virus reported from India but not pathotype is not reported pathotype bone so all these are removed and only the healthy looking seeds like this absolutely healthy looking they go for post-entry quarantine growing. And this is the post-entry quarantine greenhouse complex, what we have in headquarters. And as I said, you can have both soil-based greenhouse and the benchtop greenhouse. And this is the French bean germplasm, which was uh, grown in at Delhi. And wherever we see the symptoms, those symptomatic plants are covered with muslin cloth bag so that the insects will not transmit from the virus from infected plants to healthy plants. Nowhere in the world the greenhouses are free from insects. One should accept that, but we need to maintain it insect proof by killing them. Keep spraying the insecticide so that no insect. Because all of you know if you are wearing yellow clothes and then all these effects get attracted. And also the mites, you wouldn't even know that the mites are there on your clothes and when you enter the greenhouse, they will go inside. So you need to spray the insecticide and make it insect proof. And this, this is like you when you had a COVID-19, you were isolated yourself, right? Like that, are any of your relatives or any of your friends. This is isolation. And then um, benchtop greenhouse also you, we use. We have both. And this is the post quarantine at uh, Jain Irrigation. As I said, we grow only legumes at Delhi and also Hyderabad from seed to seed because more than 130 seed transmitted viruses, 50% infect the legumes. So this, these, these are not given to you. These are grown here and only the harvest from virus tested and virus free plants is given to you. And the rest of the material is released and undertaking. Uh, it is called provisional release, whether it is a public sector or private sector. This is the citrus. And we found two exotic viruses in this consignment and incinerated them. And this is the uh, tomato germplasm grown at uh, Syngenta. And you can see the symptoms here. And we found pepina mosaic virus not reported from India. And uh, again, the same one, pepina mosaic virus. And this is the par grown at another private company. And these are the symptoms, like uh, whether it is a mosaic, vein banding, vein clearing, all these symptomatic plants are tested and also representative healthy looking samples also tested because the viruses are known to have latent latency, masked symptoms. And then these symptomatic leaves are tested using electron microscope. This is transmission electron microscope, what we have at the headquarters really in our lab. And um, the electron microscopy gives us the idea of which shape and size it belongs to. Like if I find um, in wheat particles like this, uh, rigid rods, I would know maybe barley stri stripe mosaic virus is there. Or if it is a bacilli form, I would know uh, I, that it can be alpha alpha mosaic virus. Or if it is a um, flexuous rod particles, I would know it belongs to 140 virus group. 
once we see these particles then we go for elisa and we have in our lab it is about we have 60 to 70 viruses antisera and um, i am not going to details because on 15th you have practicals and wherever you have yellow color those are positive samples and uh, also we take the optical density value so that twice the value of the negative control we consider them as positive and we have developed reverse transcription pcr protocols for all these uh, viruses exotic ones and multiplex pcr protocols also so this is one is for five viruses so instead of doing five single pcrs we do the one pcr and putting all the primers in one tube and uh, we have also de developed some real time reverse transcription pcr protocols for bin pod motile virus not reported from india helicase dependent amplification and loop mediated isothermal amplification these two this technique most of you must be knowing this you don't need the electrophoresis and also you can quantify the pathogen and uh, these two techniques doesn't need the thermal cycler you don't need a pcr machine but these are highly uh, that company oriented you have to buy everything from them so just because i have shown all these techniques it doesn't mean that we use all of them no if we see the virus particles and if the optical density values are good in elisa we stop there if there is any confusion then only we go for pcr and these techniques and we have intercepted 45 viruses in different uh, legumes cereals tomato chili diasporia from different countries both developed countries like usa canada are in asian countries east asian countries like korea thailand or a small country like costa rica so the germplasm we get but we do the stringent quarantine and these are some of the exotic viruses not reported from india 19 of them sorry so when we after we uh, when we go for post entry quarantine inspection we bring the samples and test them in the lab but if we find any symptomatic ones we remove and uproot then and there so by the time we bring them and test if there are vectors then they will spread the viruses so um, both even uh, bacteria fungi infected plants they are all uprooted and if if that state government has the no objection to incinerate then we incinerate uh, but some of the state governments do not promote the incineration that time we dig a pit and bury them and then uh, uh, this is all about uh, non transgenics for uh, transgenic germplasm we have imported about 17000 samples uh, whether it is arabidopsis or tomato wheat potato and even uh, gmas so a to z the transgenic germplasm is imported not the commercial material and we have developed the guidelines for import and quarantine on transgenic planting material if any one of you needs that you mail me then i can send you a soft copy and uh, the procedure is same except that you need import clearance from rcgm review committee on genetic manipulation through ibsc and the material is processed at containment facility as i have explained earlier and we use all the conventional serological molecular techniques for, to detect the pests and also use the phytosanitary treatments and go for post entry quarantine inspection whether it is a cotton or soya bean or um, tobacco corn or diasporia these are the tissue culture material eucalyptus and uh, we do test and then we yeah these are some of the post entry quarantine inspections and transgenics germplasm doesn't mean that they come very healthy they are, they don't come free from pests in one rice consignment we found uh, so much of infection even the soil clots also i hope i have that slide and these are some of the pests intercepted including the ones not reported from india 
like Peronospora manchurica, cryptolestis. This is an insect. And we have intercepted many viruses. These are like high plains virus in transgenic maize. And we have intercepted maize chlorotic mottle virus and um, soybean viruses. You can see the red color ones, five of them. These are just in a representative ones I'm showing. So what do you mean by interception is we are detecting and we are intercepting it. So we are not allowing it to enter the country. All these viruses were stopped from USA to enter into India because we have detected and then we have incinerated the material. And Dr. Monica will take the practicals in the afternoon for this, but this is part of the quarantine. That's why I took the slide from her. And uh, all the transgenic samples, 16,000, how many? Yeah, 16,940 samples, uh, whether it is A to Z, Arabidopsis to GMAs, are tested for pests and then also the embryogenesis deactivated gene and none of the samples are positive. And after this, the material is uprooted and disposed in the presence of IBSC. I'm a member of the Institutional Biosafety Committee. And uh, even the soil is also um, buried in the pit. And then in one of the post entry quarantine inspections, like um, uh, we found maize chlorotic mottle virus in uh, maize, even in the non-symptomatic one. So the entire consignment, we went twice. Entire consignment is uprooted and incinerated in my presence. And uh, the MNCs are here, but MNC multinational companies do follow the law of the land. And um, this is about uh, disinfestation and disinfection. And we have, um, again, on 15th, the practical will be taken. And, uh, it starts with the mechanical cleaning, pesticidal dip, and then acid wash for uh, beet rust, spirit wash for safflower rust. Safflower rust is present in India, but it, we don't want to isolate from outside. And X-ray is both salvaging and uh, detection technique. And fumigation is followed for uh, insects. And hot water for uh, rice, it is a prophylactic. But in whether you see anything or not, rice is given prophylactic treatment at 52 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes, but the viability is not lost. And then brassica, if you find anything, then the hot water treatment is given. And this is the fumigation chamber, and this is the X-ray machine, and here hot water treatment is done, and this is the pesticide. And these are some of the... Um, photos of how the pesticide takes treatment. So all of you, whoever is importing the material, so you can see that a lot of work goes in NBPGR quarantine division. My first posting was in IHR Bangalore and um, I used to get uh, tomato and chili, especially from AVRDC Taiwan, but I never knew that so much of work goes on here. All the tomato chili are given 10% trisodium orthophosphate treatment, apart from the detection techniques for fungi, bacteria, viruses. And um, I just used to get the material and you, you used to use it for my research work. So I hope you appreciate the amount of work goes on in quarantine division. And um, these are the quarantine clearance. Once all the tests are done, all the treatments are given, then the material is entered here. Like you can see 1,497 samples of beans. They were tested and uh, for, uh, all the samples are released. Of course, the head quarantine signature and all is mandatory. And then um, the similar to import, the export in quarantine is also done. If you, any one of you is exporting material to IRI or Ricarda or even uh, Bangladesh, this has to go through this process. And we have the soft copies and also the hard copy, maintain the registers. And this is a sample photosanitary certificate. And transgenics also uh, has been exported following the same procedure. And uh, if we have not done all this, just to impress upon you, like this many million rupees would have been lost if we have not stopped the entry of either the fungus or the virus or the insect. 
And then we also help the uh, DPPKS in trade negotiations. This is one example in the year 2007, the US wheat was to be imported. So a team of experts went to US. So there is a provision for that. Like from Japan, the experts come and see our facilities. Similarly, the Indian government has sent a team of experts, including had uh, quarantine and Joint Secretary Plant Production and others. And they found that US wheat is, fields, they have found bromocicalinus, which is abundant, and it is not there in India. So the Indian government has suggested that to get rid of this wheat, or you have the low weed infestation areas. Finally, US couldn't do it because they have a large acreage and they don't have the provision to make it weed free then the Indian government has not imported that material and it has come in times of India also. And also we do get the samples from DPPKS as an R&D arm of DPPKS and we test the material here for viruses, for fungus, as per the requirement. And uh, this, part, this is just one example where six metric tons of basil seeds were imported from Germany and uh, our scientists found uh, these two weeds. So, we advise that it is not advisable to allow the entry of six metric tons of basil. And there are guidelines for quarantine processing of material imported for proficiency testing. If any one of you is participating in the proficiency testing, the procedure is simple. Get two samples in duplicate. One is used for quarantine testing at NBPGR and one is sent to you if it is found free from exotic pests. So sometimes we you know people are sending in duplicate, but um, state seed certification agencies, they don't send in duplicate, then we don't, if without testing, well, and if you send only one sample, then if you take out the samples for pest detection of pests, then you will, proficiency testing results will not be correct. So we, for come up with this strategy that you will get the duplicate and we will test one for quarantine. And USA has a very good national plan diagnostic network where um, you can see all these five labs, whether it is UC Davis or Kansas State University, Michigan, Cornell, they all have this, use the same diagnostics. If you have to test for the PCR, the methodology is shared with everybody. And also uh, they have the microscope identification connected through the web 10 years back when I went to Kansas State University. And they have the Biosecurity Research Institute, BSL-3, BSL-4. They work on exotic pathogens there. And this is National Institute for Microbial Forensics and Biosecurity. This is again one another biosecurity lab which I visited. And the, even Australia has the National Plant Biosecurity Diagnostic Network, similar to USA, like they share the protocols you can see here. And um, if the material has to go from Perth, it is Western Australia to Melbourne, then the material will grow go as per the requirement of the Southeast province. And similarly in uh, US also, if the material has to go from Washington state to, for example, Kansas state, then the material will be certified as per the requirement of the Kansas state. But here in India, if the material goes from Andhra Pradesh to Karnataka, there are no such regulations. And awareness among the public is huge in Australia. Like um, in one of the forms, I have seen this board. Visitors, please respect form by security. And they have mentioned uh, all these requirements like equipment uh, movement, vehicle movement restrictions, and please buy from accredited seed suppliers. And reporting unfamiliar organisms is very, very important. And they follow that. And then there, the sampling procedure, I was very impressed. All these silos for every uh, one ton, I think, uh, this, the one kg of sample comes to the biosecurity officer. There they are called biosecurity officers. In India, we call them plant quarantine officials. 
and then it goes to the lab next to that. But in India, the sampling is done physically. The plant protection officers go physically and collect the samples, but here it is automatic. For every 110, one kg sample comes to the biosecurity officer and he will collect it and then it goes to the lab. These are Indian delegates when we went in 2015. And uh, this again, traveler declaration form, we do have in India till 2019 something, 2015, I think. After that, disembarkation card is no more given in uh, India when we are coming from overseas. But you can see in South Korea also, they are asking whether you are carrying any boots like um, animals, plants, you have to declare if you are carrying that. And uh, I was surprised in South Korea, you before immigration, I, I found this animal and plant quarantine agency and also the like it is human health quarantine. All of our uh, temperatures were taken. This is before COVID actually. And then we were allowed to go inside. Same thing, Delhi flight. And then after immigration, I have seen this boat fisheries quarantine in uh, South Korea. You hardly see any quarantine boats in uh, Delhi. Only in Terminal 3, when I walk towards the end, I have seen the quarantine office. If you, you really have to, once you come out, you have to walk towards your left. You see one office of quarantine along with the customs center. And in Australia also, they have it, they're very strict. You all know that the biosecurity system in Australia and New Zealand is the best. And uh, island countries, and also they are very careful. You can see that, are you carrying grain, seeds, bulbs, straw, nuts, plants, parts of plants, traditional medicines or herbs, wooden articles. So um, you have to declare, otherwise it is a uh, $200 fine. And uh, soil also, even if you are, Packing the shoes also, they will ask you whether you have gone to the field so that they don't want you to carry the soil along with you into Australia. And uh, like, I'll give an example of med traditional medicines and herbs. When we went to Australia in 2019, my sister's in-law, they carried one herb, which is cures the diabetics. I told them, please don't carry, but then they didn't listen. So I searched and then I have written the botanical name, everything, and we carried. And when that uh, biosecurity official, she didn't allow us to carry that herb, medicinal herb. And like wooden article, once I packed one wooden spoon for my son, and then he has to declare it that he is carrying the wooden spoon. Just to make it interesting for you, okay? And then these are some of the challenges like uh, sample size, especially the germplasm. Some of you would get only 20 seeds. After 20 seeds, if we test for fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes, how much you will get? And then detecting an unknown exotic pester sign. In a way, we do it indirectly. If there are any symptomatic plants we approach so that in a way we are taking care of that. And then availability of diagnostics like you need to have the anti sera exotic viruses or for fungi, bacteria, insects, nematodes, you need to have the sequences available in the gen bank. And um, of course, the post-entry quarantine, if you are getting the soybean germplasm, if you are getting by June, then you are sure that you will get the seed material in one season. But if you are getting in January, then you have to wait another six months. And uh, as far as the capacity building is concerned, uh, we have been doing the training workshops right from uh, 2000 onwards. We have deputy project. And um, till now we have conducted more than uh, 15, 17, 18 workshops under that project every year. And also during 2015, 2018, we conducted training workshop for both plant quarantine and customs officials. We didn't call them to, we did call them to Delhi for a few workshops, three workshops, but then later we went to them wherever there is a seaport or airport or land frontier like Amritsar or Roxol, that is Indo-Nepal border and then Shillong, uh, Indo-Bangladesh border. And these are the dots you can see and read wherever we went. 
we all the faculty of four of us went there and gave them the training and we took them to seaports and showed the importance of documentary requirement and in that process i had the opportunity to visit uh, many seaports and actually have the feel of what do you mean by bulk consignment commercial material it is not like jump plaza and uh, in 2021 and 2022 recently we have conducted uh, training programs on biosecurity and biosafety and each training program we have trained 80 participants and uh, last year in august you can see there were participants from almost all the such states except some of the northeastern states why because it was online and when i tried to make it in person we hardly got any applications since it is an online uh, everybody is interested but as much as you get in person especially the practicals one should attend the in person so next year we are this year 2023 we will have the in person workshop this training program for 10 days uh, if you are interested in biosecurity and biosafety please attend or you tell your friends and colleagues to attend around the same time august 2023 and then this is a, a national certification system i was telling you there are accredited labs five accredited labs across the country and two referral labs whatever the material tested by accredited labs goes to the referral lab also and the virus free true to type tissue culture material is given to the farmers and same way for gmo detection there are three four referral laboratories um, dr monica will explain you more in uh, four different states and uh, these are the referral laboratories if any farmer anybody wants to test the material you can send to any of these material why i am showing both these accredited laboratories for ncs tcp and also the gm detection is for pest detection us and australia has a diagnostic network but in india we don't have that diagnostic network but doesn't mean that it cannot work here it is already working for gmo detection it is already working for tissue culture only thing is government of india needs to have this nppdn in india also and with quarantine stations and uh, other laboratories interconnected and this is the very recent one in january 2023 government of india has started uh, initiated this program of clean plant propagated material and um, there are about public and private sector institutes have attended this program to make it possible to access the disease free planting material especially for fruit crops like uh, apple walnut almonds so citrus and i think this program will come somewhere in 2024 definitely this was consultancies has started in 2022 i have been attending this programs and it looks promising that the farmers will get the disease planting material similarly they need to have the accredited labs for testing and all that and these are some of the phytosanitary issues i will not go into the details uh, except that the last one awareness among researchers is also equally important like um, and sorry to say like when we go for post entry quarantine inspection the jump plasm especially they don't follow the isolation distance you need to follow the isolation distance don't put the jump plasm in the center along with other jump plasm if you are growing pea you all know that the pathogens which can affect pea can affect other legumes so maintain the isolation distance and also as far as possible try to have the close to post entry quarantine facility if you are importing the jump plasm uh, most of the scientists they don't really appreciate the importance of uh, growing them in isolation please do follow that and the rest is these are all you can uh, see that you need to have the funds for inspection authorities and all and uh, the, as far as export is concerned like the phytosanitary certificate issuance were not reported from india i'll just one take one example uh, 
tomato germplasm to be exported to EU. EU is asking that you test for tomato brown rugos fruit virus using real time PCR. And then the tomato brown rugos fruit virus is officially not reported. It is, there is no report. But still, in bilateral agreement, those issues are there. Yeah, some viruses names are not as per International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. If you are a soya bean breeder, if you are importing the germplasm, you will see the additional declarations as mosaic drawer. Those are symptoms, not the virus names. But you might be asking, then what are you doing? We are not authorized to review the PQ order. And we have told many times the DPP guests to review and update the plant quarantine order. And when they do that, they will definitely take our inputs. And tissue culture material doesn't need post-entry quarantine inspection as per the PQ order. But all of you know that tissue culture doesn't mean that viruses are free. So those are the issues. Maybe we can discuss whenever you visit uh, Delhi. And uh, at the end, my dream is to see the National Plant Pest Diagnostic Network and Clean Plant Program in India. And uh, if you closely monitor which pests are most frequently reported, for example, wheat blast was reported in Bangladesh, then immediately the Indian government has taken the appropriate measures and continually surveying. That is, surveillance is very, very important for uh, identifying the new pests. And the rest are wish list need to have early warning system, rapid response teams like COVID-19, and the roster of experts is there with NIPHM, but they're not really using it. I think this is my last slide. Yeah, I acknowledge ICR, NBPGR, DBT. DBT gives a lot of funding to us, and MOEF, um, under that, we have conducted those uh, 15 or 14 workshops and trained customs and plant quarantine officials, and UNEP Jeff also. Thank you all for patient hearing. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, participants are requested if you have any doubts or queries, you can interact with the speaker. Ma'am, Dr. K. N. Gupta from, yes, please. Hello, hello, hello sir. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Madam is ah. here, yes. Hello, madam. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon, Dr. Gupta. Yeah, madam, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I have learned yeah. so many things in your sites, madam. Uh, only, only one, I have one question, only, okay, sir, madam, if you have some pre-infection in germ plan, so then how which, can I identify? Which infection? Phylody. Phylody infection. See, uh, one thing is phylody. In early stage. You have to do the PCR. You are a part of the project, no, Dr. Gupta? Yes, madam. Yeah, yeah. You, there is no other way. You have to do the PCR, nested PCR, and the primers are, all the literature is available. And now, Philodi identification has become much easier. And symptoms also, most of the symptoms give you an idea about whether it is a virescence, um, or punching, or even uh, it becomes a scale like, no? Fasciation. Even the symptoms are somehow, sometimes it is very. But, but of course, as you said, it comes late in the stage. But if you want to identify initially, then you have to go for this. Oh, madam, when you start a workshop for uh, training? Yeah, in August. I we need will, to madam, training for your... Okay, okay. You just... I have your uh, ID, I think. Right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Welcome, ma'am. And any other participants? Ma'am, I hope. Ma'am, I, 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 yes, yes. I, I am yes. Professor Yadav, working yes. in Shivaji University, Kolhapur. Uh, I, I must congratulate you for such a wonderful lecture on land quarantine. 
because this is a big issue for entire world and uh, you have told officially what needs to be done and all procedures and so many things but uh, when i think of ground reality now you know one thing uh, this export of ornamental plants bulbous plants through that what i have seen madam i should give you some examples that will clarify what i would like to say that crinum mulbaricum which we described from our country which has a very great uh, medicinal value in 6 months it was there outside the country growing in some gardens okay so how it goes i don't know then one person had come to kolapur uh, he was uh, he took some uh, bulb of arisima okay i told her, you have to take permission from this government you have to go undergo the procedure how you will take it you know he said uh, under that export of uh, this ornamental plants bulbous plants a uh, nursery trade nursery trade we don't have rules many plants from india go outside this is a one thing and uh, whatever efforts nbp jara is doing you are doing those efforts you know uh, with those plants they import also export also and many diseases many viruses come this is a one part which i have seen secondly that uh, many exotic weeds you talked about viruses and this mostly concerned with our cultivated plants but other part is that uh, you know many weeds which are coming to our country okay are going uh, outside the country from our country as a weeds so are there people who are expert to identify them at uh ports where they are uh, taken so mainly taxonomists like me also is afraid of identifying some plants uh, unless it is a entire plant or something like that only molecular biology can help us so uh this uh, you also said flowers do not require plant quarantine okay now with those uh, you know you said i something. didn't say that i said uh, flowering material seeds to go outside you don't need the exim committee permission but quarantine is required okay okay there is export import committee uh -huh. then uh, that bulk export you said so when we export or import in bulk uh, uh screening entire material also is not possible and under this situation you know today many plants have been introduced and they have created lot of problem gliricidia you know that uh, what is that mealy bugs uh, entire our area the all legumes they are infected because they uh, they be, they have become host plant so really uh, i feel that uh, uh, i mean uh, this part also has to be taken care in addition to our crop plants or those are officially exported but unofficially you know uh, i am seeing all the plants the species which is described this year uh, next year it is found somewhere else growing how it happens and then how our plant quarantine our things are going on that i don't understand yeah, can i answer yes madam yeah yeah that you are very uh, pertinently ask some questions regarding bulk material see when the we don't have the um, bio scanners when it, it is not that only the material is going out sometimes people bring also right, right. when the people go to especially bangkok and all if they like something they are bringing it is not advisable only thing is we can only do quarantine whatever it comes officially legally we right. cannot do policing that is one thing and of course the commercial material quarantine needs more stringency i would say the germplasm quarantine is stringent and we are following all the procedures and we have molecular diagnostics so what we are doing is we are doing the germplasm quarantine strictly and uh, we are intercepting and not allowing but definitely the everybody knows the commercial import needs uh, upgradation and also like they have this problem of we conduct the trainings all the plant quarantine officials 
and then after three years when we meet them they say that they have shifted to insecticide board or integrated pest management that stability is also not there with them like scientists i joined uh, if i join nbpgr i came on transfer in 2000 it is 23 years and i have not moved from here so i have developed some expertise and then before that i was in ihr bangalore so uh, in uh, directed of plant protection and quarantine and storage they are not they, they they don't have a dedicated system that is also one disadvantage and other things i don't want to talk and uh, one thing is like how the material is coming from outside we don't have the bioscanner when you go to usa or australia they have the bioscanners but we don't have the bioscanners when we discuss with them they say that we got the bioscanner maybe 10 15 years back but the airport has not given them the permission didn't give them this place and all and after that i don't think they have made any extra effort and the weeds up um, identification we have dr mulchan singh he is a weed scientist and um, he is the only one i think he, he does for directed of plant protection quarantine and storage also they send the samples and he identifies uh the weeds and i gave the one example of basil from germany and then another niger also he has uh, identified the weeds and even in the germplasm he identifies many weeds and uh, we used to have dr anjana pandey and now we have dr bhat he is a uh, taxonomist in uh, germplasm exploration if there is any doubt uh, they will also help him so weed identification is not an issue here and then uh, bulk material of course i do agree like uh, they need uh, to strengthen the system but now the things have improved they are intercepting so it is not that there is no improvement i would say that there is an improvement and if they need help they send us the samples for virus testing and even the gmo detection the samples comes to regional genomic resources diagnostic laboratory so i won't say that it, there is no improvement at all there is an improvement but still they need to be strengthened thank you madam thank you that is what i just wanted yeah. to bring yeah, to yeah yes 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 this is one question i get always <laughs> yes thank you for asking and uh, any other participants uh, uh, if you have any doubts or queries you can post in chat box also or otherwise send to our email and uh, let the time to, uh, for uh, vote of thanks to our speaker uh, ma'am thank you very much uh, it is a very highly informative and uh, uh, deep elaborated and briefly introduction of indian plant genetic uh, indian plant quarantine system and how it will be useful in biosecurity uh, to our country and what is the procedures and methods in all over uh, we are following in india and ma'am thank you very much ma'am for a, for your lecture and uh, interaction with our um, participants and thank you ma'am thank you yeah. thank you dr ravi thank you everyone yes thank you thank and dear tra trainees i am requesting uh, 230 please join we have another lecture on gmo detection um, that is an interesting lecture 230 am sorry 230 pm practical uh, session that is uh, and thank you please be in online uh, i will give you update in whatsapp account also thank you
हेलो यस मैम आवाज आ रही है मैम गुड आफ्टरनून मैम या या गुड गुड आफ्टरनून आपका इमेज थोड़ा क्लैरिटी नहीं आ रहे वॉइस अच्छा है प्ले करिए थोड़ा इसका आवाज वो रिकॉर्डेड है ना तो थोड़ा आएगा ठीक है मैम थैंक यू मैम मैं बता दूंगा आपको अभी पार्टिसिपेंट्स को रिक्वेस्ट कर आप म्यूट कर दीजिए मैम आपका
welcome back to the afternoon session dear uh, trainees now we have an interesting lecture and practical on uh, dna based procedures for production of gmos monica ma'am yeah hello good afternoon yes. good afternoon ma'am Uh, yes ma'am still participants are only 39 ma'am 40 okay okay fine just wait for ma'am 2 minutes then we okay. will start meanwhile people will join hmm? okay okay fine i'm just wait Uh, okay friends uh, let me start our session meanwhile people will join uh, welcome ma'am and uh, let me introduce our uh, our current speakers uh, now this is a session actually that is dna based gmo techniques for detection techniques uh, by first i want to introduce our uh, first speaker that is uh, dr rajesh kumar he is working as a principal scientist in plant biotechnology in division of genomic resources and his nature of work is de novo transcriptome sequencing identification of genetic ssr markers uh, especially in uh, vegetables brassica tinospora cardifolia and coarse cereals and he study uh, study of uh, polyamine metabolism and abiotic stress tolerance and he involved main uh, research work in functional analysis of water stress response to soya bean transcription factors and he is having one uh, pi as a leading one big project and three co pi as a other institutional projects and other dbt projects and he is having a wide publications in reputed international journals and the next speaker is our um, 
Dr. Monica Singh, she is a senior scientist in Agri Biotechnology uh, in Division of Genomic Resources, NVPG or New Delhi. And she is uh, more than 14 years experience in GMO detection techniques. And especially her key expertise areas are GMO detection and quantification, multi-target or multiplex PCR and real-time PCR, visual and real-time lab GMO matrix. And she is a key member in development of efficient DNA-based GMO diagnostics uh, for screening and detection of uh, genetically engineered plants. And uh, GMO detection in plant-based food derivatives and GMO testing services to public or private sector. And she is uh, uh, very much uh, interested in she developed uh, that means as a role in five cost efficient or rapid GMO screening techniques. Uh, and these are transferred to mills of DSS Image Tech Private Limited, New Delhi. And she is a recipient of several awards. Uh, even I am studying only three, four awards that is uh, Dr. Kanwar Virendra Singh Memorial for Best Publication Award, SAC Distinguished Female Scientist Award and Scientist of the Year Award 2020 in Agriculture Biotechnology. And she is having a foreign uh, visit grant also, that is Indo-Belgium Collaborative Project, and foreign visit grant for partially uh, ICGEB. And she is a recipient of CSAR Research Grant during PhD and University Merit Scholarship of MSc. Even several awards uh, they, they are, and, and she published more than 35 research papers and other publications also there. And uh, she is a perfect person in uh, GMO detection uh, laboratory techniques. And uh, dear trainees, I, I am requesting you and uh, she, you can interact with her. This is a theory and practical session. And uh, ma'am, on behalf of organizing team and other training members, uh, I am inviting you. Welcome ma'am and kindly share your uh, experience and the procedures and methods of GMO techniques and how it will be useful and how we can control the unauthorized GMOs uh, in uh, our India. And uh, thank you, ma'am. Please, ma'am. Okay. okay, thank you, Dr. Ravi, for giving this uh, opportunity to interact with the participants. Uh, just I want to know the brief background of the participants. You can just brief down. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, these are the participants uh, of 84 candidates from different uh, institutes. Nearly 18 organization institutes, institutes are there, ma'am. And mostly are, ma'am, breeders. And they want to conduct the collection and conservation of germplasm. And even though some, they need uh, quarantine facilities like information, ma'am, information and other things. And okay. uh, they can interact with you, ma'am. But all are ma different discipline, ma'am, actually. Multidiscipline. Okay, fine. Uh, okay, yes. okay. And so I, I am from biotechnology is there. Uh, from biotechnology, biotechnology or molecular biology is there, ma'am. Okay. Trainees and anybody from biotechnology or molecular biology, please. Even in between, also you can interact with ma'am. And okay. she is the right person for uh, GMOs, techniques, or any other thing. And it is a practical session. Please interact. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Thank okay. Please, you, Dr. Yeah. Uh, please. Okay. Shall I start now? No? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon to all of you. And ma'am, another two persons are from uh, International Ecorda Institute, ma'am. Okay. Sure. Uh, yes, okay. ma'am. So, uh, slide is visible? This is uh, not in PowerPoint mode, ma'am. Okay, now it? Ah, yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. So now, uh, today I will be going to discuss about the detection of the genetically modified crops. And uh, I, I would like to uh, get the response of all the participants. Uh, they can interrupt uh, at the time of presentation also, okay? If you have any query or doubt, right? So I would like uh, to, okay, for, uh, me, uh, actually I want to uh, have the discussion in between also, okay, fine. So anybody can tell what are the transgenic crops or genetically modified crops?
Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, any of the participants can tell about the gene what are genetically modified crops or transgenic crops. Please, anybody, anybody can tell. Ma'am, you continue, ma'am. Okay, yes, fine. Yes, yes, ma yes. So, the first, what are the genetically modified crops? We commonly call them biotech crops or transgenic crops. So, these are the crops which are developed by the insertion of the foreign gene, either from another plant or bacteria into the plant genomic DNA employing the genetically engineering tools that is mainly recombinant DNA technology is employed. So these genetic crops, genetic, uh, genetically modified crops, they either uh, expresses the uh, genes for the new trait as like Bt cotton. We have, uh, I think all of you have heard about the Bt cotton which has been commercialized in our country, okay? And they can also modify an already existing trait, for example, as in the uh, um, nutritional enhancement in some of the crops. So anybody can tell about what are what is authorized or unauthorized crops, the genetically modified crops. Hmm. Anybody can, can tell what is authorized and what is unauthorized? Hmm. Dear participants, uh, you are requested, please switch on videos. This is a practical examination, na? practical. Na? Anybody can tell what, what is authorized? Authorized for a country. What is authorized for uh, India? Yes not genetically modified anything what is authorized and what is unauthorized unauthorized yes ma'am you continue ma'am yes yes ma okay okay yes. fine so, yes yes yeah. yes government approval unauthorized is when it is not approved by the government can you speak aloud a little bit Authorized one is the one which is been approved by the government. Yeah. Is which is not approved by the government. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Very good. Uh, yeah, that uh, these are the same thing is for the authorized genetically modified or authorized transgenic crops. Like in India, which has been approved by uh, our government for the commercial use, that is the authorized GM crop. So globally, there are more than 140 GM events. What are the GM events? GM events, they have unique uh, integration site of a particular genetic construct. Okay. So globally, they, in different countries, there are more than 540 GM events commercialized. Out of these, only four have been commercialized in our country. That is BT cotton. Can you tell which events have been commercialized? The try one you see, BT. <coughs> yeah, it's Bolgard 1 with try one you see gene, Bolgard 2, event okay. GFM, and event 1. Yes. Fine? Just wait. So these four events, only the four events are authorized in our country. Rest of the events which have been approved in another, other countries, these are unauthorized in the Indian context, okay? So why GM detection is required? As there are more, uh, a large number of events have been commercialized, so we have to detect each and every <coughs> event in the imported consignments, okay? So what is the, I, I am just touching the brief about the regulatory for framework of GMOs in India. I think um, in the morning there was the session by Dr. Celia, fine.
Yes, madam. Quarantine. <laughs> yeah, quarantine. Whether she has touched these? GMOs, GMOs. She didn't touch. Okay, okay. So these are the way. There are very stringent regulation for the genetically modified organisms in our country, and these are the different. Uh, committees or regulatory or authorities which have been defined for the regulation of GMOs. Okay, GMOs are genetically modified organisms. So first is the recombinant DNA advisory committee, which has the advisor advisory role, and they review the developments in the biotechnology research which are dealing with the GMOs in our country. and these are dealing the uh, gmos research as national as well as at international levels so they are also uh, the advisory committee which are uh, which recommend the suitable and appropriate safety regulations for india in the recombinant dna research then second two uh, these committees are that is review committee on genetic manipulation and genetic engineering appraisal committee these are the regulatory authorities which provide provides approval like rcgm it provides approval for the import of transgenics whereas gac they provides approval for the field trials of transgenic crops in our country as well as commercialization of the transgenic crops and other is the institutional biosafety committee it is also an uh, approval type of committee which allows the which or takes care of the activities related to the gmos at the institutional level and these state biotechnology coordination committee and district level committee these are under the state governments and they are they have the monitoring role and they can uh, take or uh, they can monitor the activities related to the gmos at the state level or district level so in india the gmos are regulated under the rules 1989 that is the rules for manufacture use import export and storage of hazardous microorganisms genetically engineered organisms or cells and these has been notified under environment protection act 1986 and for the regulation of gm ingredients in food very recently have you heard about these draft regulations that is food safety and standards genetically modified foods regulations 2022 these are just the draft has been uploaded at the fssai fssai site for the comments but it has not yet been implemented according to this all the products need to be labeled with the words contains genetically modified organisms if the product contains 1% or more of a particular gm ingredient in it so here is the what is the role of nbpgr in, uh, in uh, transgenics or in gm detection so icr nbpgr is the nodal agency to issue import permits and undertakes plant quarantine quarantine processing of transgenic as per government of india notification and under the plant quarantine uh, order 2003 so uh, how the nb how ndpgr it came, comes into the role for the transgenics uh, since 1998 the transgenics ha have been imported for research purposes so nbpgr it acts as the nodal agency to permit the import of transgenics for research purposes and till date more than 245 consignments have been imported and uh, before release of the transgenics to the importers the quarantine processing of these trans transgenics are the and in addition molecular testing for the terminator gene technology way back in early in late 1990s there was the issue of the terminator gene presence of the terminator gene in the transgenics in initial stage, stages so since they are then the this activity has been assigned to nbpgr whether that all the imported transgenics they should be free of terminator gene technology 
so the gm detection laboratory at mdpgr it checks the terminator gene technology as well as also ensures the presence of all the transgenic elements in a particular imported transgenic which has been claimed by the importer or the source of import so before coming to the practical session or activities related to gm detection i would like to add that gm detection research facility at an uh, nbpgr new delhi it is uh, accredited as per iso iec 17025 standards by nabl so in uh, icr it is the only gmo testing laboratory which has been accredited by the nabl so we have the scored we covered the different uh, uh, testing of different uh, seeds of different crops and also this covers the gmo testing in oil and the lab has also been uh, identified designated as one of the national referral laboratories by department of agriculture and farmers welfare under the ministry of agriculture farmers welfare and this is what about the layout of an accredited facility it has the different chambers for different activities like sample grinding is carried out in one chamber then followed by dna extraction in separate room followed by setting up of pcr or gmo testing or post pcr analysis so uh, uh, till now if anyone anybody has any query they can ask okay madam regarding your uh, targets no the genes you have yeah yeah can you speak a little bit loud uh, your target genes you have mentioned here no madam their uh, bar gene is not included am i yeah actually these are the under the scope of our facility uh, that is uh, what uh, what is meant by the scope of accreditation like we have to validate everything and we have the data for everything and we have to maintain all the Uh, uh clauses of the iso standard for these targets okay uh, in addition we are also testing a large number of targets like you have, have you said uh, like you have said bar gene and other genes okay and uh, event specific detection also we we are carrying out i will be discuss in det detail in uh, the uh, uh, coming slides okay these are only under the scope of accreditation like we are providing the gm testing services if we want to uh, test these parameters so we can use the uh, symbol of nabl in our report okay these are the accredited parameters okay fine fine ma'am okay so uh, there is a small video we'll give, which will give, give a glimpse of our of our gm detection research facility Samsung Silver GM Detection Research Facility. It is accredited as per ISO 17025 International Standards by National Accreditation Board for Testing and Calibration Laboratory. The entry to the facility is restricted to authorized staff to avoid cross-contamination and to maintain the confidentiality. There is unidirectional flow of samples, and for this, the facility has dedicated room for each activity. First of all, the sample is homogenized to fine powder in sample preparation room after registration and coding. In DNA extraction room, DNA is extracted from the seed or leaf sample using validated protocols. DNA extraction is carried out in a tube bowl. Incubation is done in a water bath, followed by a centrifugation step in a refrigerated centrifuge. The DNA extracts are quantified using the UV spectrophotometer. After that, the DNA samples are passed into PCR setup room to pass boxes. In PCR room, the setting of PCR reaction is done in a biopastry cabinet or a laminar closed chamber to avoid any cross contamination. There is a 
dedicated storage facilities for reference material and a factory stumble for storage of stock as well as working reagents. Documentation is an important part of ISO 17025, which is maintained as per the ISO standard. Here is the PCR and real-time PCR room. The facility is maintained as per ISO 17025 standard to avoid any cross contamination in the PM testing. PCR reactions are run in thermal cycles and real time PCR system. In real time PCR, data is simultaneously analyzed during the process of reaction. After completion of conventional PCR, PCR analysis is done in a post-PCR analysis room. In this chamber, the facility is available for preparation of agarose gel and the UV gel documentation system for visualization of the separated products on agarose gel. The PCR products are run on the agarose gel in the electrophoretic assembly dedicated for CMO testing. Along with the PCR amplified product, the standard size marker is also loaded so as to estimate the exact size of the PCR product so that we can identify whether the product is specific for a particular GM target. Finally, these products are visualized in the gel documentation unit after the completion of run for two to three hours. Here is the decontamination room. After completion of GM testing of a sample, decontamination is finally done so as to avoid the cross contamination in further processing of a new sample before exit to the facility. Thanks to all of you. Okay, uh, earlier video. Just this is uh, uh, this has given a glimpse that how the in a, a GMO testing facility, if it is accredited or as per ISO guidelines, there uh, we have to avoid the contamination to provide the quality GMO testing. So uh, uh, here uh, now coming to the uh, a little bit about the practical session. I, ju I just want to give about what is the GM detection. Like for uh, GM detection, uh, like uh, if uh, you are uh, well aware with the molecular biology techniques like DNA extraction and PCR. So GM detection is also, it can be carried out the PCR based GM testing. So before conducting the GM testing of a sample, first of all, after the DNA extraction, we have to amplify with the endogenous reference gene so that we can check whether it, it, is, uh, it is amplifiable. Like first we have to ensure the quality of the DNA sample, DNA of the test sample for which we, we would like to test whether it is GM or not GM. Then after that, uh, as I have stated earlier that uh, globally more than 540 GM events have been commercialized. 
so testing for each and every gm event in a particular sample is very difficult so we uh, select some screening targets screening targets which include the promoters terminators and marker genes so first we test the particular sample with these promoters like uh, 35s promoter fmv promoter or nos terminator uh, genes or specific genes like tri1 ac eps ps gene so that uh, if the sample comes gm then we can categorize whether it uh, whether it is authorized or unauthorized like uh, as already mentioned that bt cotton it contains tri1 ac gene like if the sam cotton sample it contains tri1 ac gene it may be authorized and then we can go for the event specific test like if we uh, found the, uh, the uh, this eps ps gene for herbicide tolerance in a cotton sample that is uh, that is uh, like uh, this uh, herbicide resistance cotton samples they are events they are not commercialized in our country so we have to uh, we have to check for these unauthorized gm events in the test samples and this is the what a simple genetic uh, foreign gene construct uh, just an representative layout uh, which contains the promoter genes marker genes and terminator so uh, the uh, gm detection targets they may be screening targets like which can target the promoter or terminator they may be gene specific like they can target the uh, foreign gene which has been inserted in a particular transgenic crop or they may target the marker gene and additionally there are more specific targets that is construct specific and event specific is the construct specific target that is one region we can uh, i am target for promoter like promoter and another from the adjacent transgenic element like transgene and this is the event specific detection is the most specific detection which can be used for the characterization of a particular gm crop it targets as i have earlier stated that event is a which has the unique restriction site in the plant genome so in this for event specific detection we target one region from the transgenic construct and another from the uh, native plant genome so there are the different guidelines which have been uh, approved by the uh, different agencies here is the example of the uh, guidelines which are given by the european union for the uh, how the gm test what are the criteria for the gm testing methods how we can interpret the gm testing results and so on so uh, at So far, if you have any question or query, anybody? Madam. Yeah. No, no, ma'am. Can I ask? Okay. So everything is clear. No, madam. Yeah. Madam, you are saying uh, gene specific targets that the primers they will supply to you for PCR conduct. yeah primers we have like we uh, design the primers okay like they, if there is cri1 ac gene right uh, we get the sequence of the cri1 ac gene from the so, some source like uh, ncbi there are the sequence of the genes are available and from the sequence of the particular gene or the sequence information of gene can be provided by the developer or importer also okay from these gene we design the primers like for cri1 ac gene we can design the primers and then we validate those primers or i have given the site for the european union site also they have also the uh, gm database okay uh, database for the gm detection methods from there also we can pick uh, certain primers for certain uh, targets like their ep a uh, target for eps ps primers for eps ps is available and then we can validate that primer or a sequence in our laboratory and then we can use for the gm testing fine okay okay, okay. 
so these uh, um, there are two types of methods dna based and protein based methods in this uh, lecture i will be focusing on the dna based technology only because uh, we are doing the gmo testing in the food products also where the protein may be degraded and the fragments of dna may be there so here i will be focusing on the dna based techniques which can allow the gm testing in seeds also as well as in the food products and dna based techniques these are of different type first is the polymerase chain reaction uh, and uh, polymerase chain reaction where the dna is amplified you by using the uh, primers specific to a particular gm target and this is the conventional pcr and we can do multiplexing in pcr also where a large number where two or more different targets they can be amplified simultaneously in a run like if we want to test uh, two to two, uh, two or three uh, this promoter and uh, uh, terminator g uh, terminator sequences in a single run we can use the multiplex pcr assay so uh, i think now after this uh, uh, covid testing all of us are aware of the real time pcr that is uh, real time pcr this is also uh, this uh, this is also widely used in gm detection also globally and in our country also so here we use the specific probes along with the primers the specific probes are also uh, used which can uh, bind to the um, uh, region which is amplified by the primers and this is the provides more specificity than the pcr and uh, the major difference is in this pcr we uh, first we have to amplify the uh, products then we have to run the agarose gel and then uh, we can analyze the results so this is an end point detection whereas in real time pcr at the time of the running of reaction we can analyze the results while running of the reaction in the terms of the fluorescence signal this is the fluorescence based amplification curve and also we are also carried out isothermal amplification that is the loop mediated isothermal amplification where Uh, the incubation can be done at a single temperature like in pcr different steps are required like denaturation we require uh, above 90 degree temperature for annealing we require 60 to 70 degree uh, sorry 50 to 65 degree temperature and for extension we require 72 degree uh, temperature whereas in lamp we require as the technology indicates that isothermal amplification so only at single temperature either at 60 or 62 degree the amplification of the uh, uh, dna takes place using the primer specific for a gm target and after the incubation we add a dye we add the dye cyber green dye and if it turns green so uh, we can consider it gm and if it it remains orange we can consider it as non gm so this method can be used for on site detection also because there is no heavy or bulky equipment are required so as um, as i have already mentioned that a large number of gm events have been commercialized in uh, uh, globally and in india only four bt cotton's like uh, events have been commercialized which are mon 5 p1 or bolgard 1 bolgard 2 gfm and event 1 so what is the matrix approach this is the uh, decision uh, decision support system like uh, this is just an excel sheet where we can add events on one side and the uh, targets or the transgenic elements on the other side which are present in a particular gm event or crop so like in uh, all the commercialized events 35s promoter is present nos terminator is present and cryo-ac gene is present so if we found any of these targets in a sample of cotton we can say that it is authorized in our country however the roundup ready cotton and this another event of uh, uh, insecticide resistance cotton these are not yet commercialized in our country 
and these contain they they do not contain cry one ac gene instead they contain eps ts gene or another bt or the insect resistance gene so if these uh, targets are present in a sample of cotton we can say that these gm even this uh, uh, these test sample it contains the gm crops or events which are not approved in our country so this gmo matrix they can uh, um, Uh, uh, help us to select the targets which we have to test when we have when we receive a sample. For example, if we have uh, we receive a sample of cotton, we can test for cry one AC and EPS TSG to check whether it is approved in our country or not approved in our country. so uh, the, the information which can be included in gmo matrix they can be added by searching the details of the gm events from the gm approval or the gm databases like this is the gm approval database which is maintained by isa and biosafety clearing house also these are also maintaining the uh, gmo databases we, we can get the information from the these uh, databases which can which have the complete information of the uh, transgenic crop so yeah this is the um, uh, gmo methods which is maintained by the european union reference laboratory here we can select the different methods like there are available method event specific methods for detection of a uh, different events of maize soya bean cotton and there are the different element methods available like for uh, 35s promoter uh, this eps ts gene so we can take the sequence of the primers from these uh, uh, databases also so once we can develop a method we have to validate the method and what is the validation that validation if we pick the primers from some other source then uh, we are implementing in our laboratory so first we have to validate that uh, we have to validate like uh, if we select the uh, tag uh, the like method for detection of cry1 ac gene so we have to check it for the specificity like specificity uh, specificity like with the samples which contains the cry1 ac they should amplify and the other uh, gm varieties which do not contain the cry1 ac gene they should not amplify so we have to come to ensure the specificity and sensitivity is the limit of detection like like what is the minimum level or minimum percentage of the gm content which is detected by a particular method then after the method validation we can apply for the testing to the real samples whether, uh, whether they are uh, gm or non gm Okay, if you have any question till now, madam, you are doing yes. intra-laboratory and inter-laboratory. Uh, are there any PG tests you are for? Uh, you are uh, doing, madam? For, uh, yeah, we are doing the uh, actually intra-laboratory is within the laboratory. Yeah. Okay. No PT PT test profession. Yeah, inter laboratory. We are conducting the inter laboratory. Uh, this I inter labor inter laboratory. We are not uh, conducting the proficiency testing. We are conducting the inter laboratory con uh, comparison programs. Okay, where we uh, like we are, where we mix the samples. We prepare the samples two to three samples. Then we can uh, then uh, the send to the different participating laboratories. Okay. so we are conducting first earlier we have conducted for oil and we um, in the, this uh, next month we will be conducting for the food products madam one more question yeah the target uh, size they have mentioned a particular size for example 500 uh, base plates if by using your primers if you didn't get uh, some 400 420 base plates like that then how we will uh, go yeah that is the math, that comes under the method validation okay like if we some uh, we have uh, if like uh, so we have picked some primers okay for cry1 ac gene or any gene which has like 400 base pairs right mm -hmm. 
but in our uh, um, in our samples there may be the amplification of some other size also like in addition to 400 base pair there may be uh, the amplification for 200 base pair or 300 base pair right uh, then we have to optimize the conditions in our laboratory okay we have to adjust the primer concentration in that case this comes under the method validation okay uh, so we have to like reduce the primer concentration so that the uh, there will be uh, no uh, there will be no formation of the non specific products like this is the 400 base pair is the specific product we have to identify only the specific product not the non specific products okay Then one more uh, is uh, food. Uh, food for food also you are testing, no, madam. Whether GM. Yeah. Uh, have you tested any crop, no, like uh, several in uh, um, outside? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually I'm not able to hear your voice. Can you speak aloud, or you can you come close to the speaker? Yeah, I have increased my volume, speaker volume. Yeah. Um, mm, have are you, uh, madam? You have told that you are doing for. Uh, Food, food crops also. Food. Yeah, yeah. GM testing inputs. Yeah. So, uh, till now, what are the crops you have tested, madam? Have you find anything? Uh, uh, many people are saying maize. Uh, that maize. Uh, somebody is saying that whether we are eating is uh, GM maize or uh, like that. Actually, we have tested the um, products from the market. Okay. Maize products like uh, corn soup and uh, this corn flakes and uh, uh, this um, uh, corn powder and these all we purchase from the market. We have tested, but uh, till now we have not found any GM. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you have told about that. You have asked about the bar gene. so this is the multiplex uh, pcr which has been developed by our laboratory which can simultaneously detect from uh, all the marker genes which are commonly employed in uh, in the development of the transgenic crops that is npt2 add a bar pat hpt uid uh, for example by running this uh, uh, multiplex pcr we can say that whether the sample is gm or not non gm so this has included the bar gene also so this is the another first we have developed the uh, matrix for the uh, globally uh, approved events or varieties of the cotton and maize and we identify the common targets and then we develop the multiplex pcr for example this multiplex pcr can be used for the gm testing in cotton and uh, here if any of the targets it uh, comes uh, a sample comes positive for any of these targets then we can say it is gm positive similarly we have developed the uh, multiplex pcr for detect uh, for gm detection in maize also so this is the multiplex pcr which can uh, which has been used for the uh, uh, screening or detection of the approved bt cotton events in our country <clears throat> so this is the uh, multiplex pcr which is uh, targeting the gene specific uh, region for example cryvnac these all the examples for the cryvnac gene in different uh, bt crops and this is for cryvnab gene these are the construct uh, construct specific pcr i have I, as i have already told that the construct region it targets the two adjacent transgenic elements like promoter or transgene or transgene or terminator region so these are the different construct specific pcr uh, profiles so this is the event uh, uh, i think all of you are aware about the bt brinjal event ee1 event it is it is developed by india by maheco company but it is commercialized in uh, bangladesh and philippines 
so we have also developed the event specific pcr and real time pcr assay for the detection or characterization of this bt brinjal event ee1 so this uh, event specific uh, uh, assay targets the region that is one from the transgenic uh, uh, construct region and another from the flanking genome region so it is the most specific detection method for the complete characterization of a particular um, a variety so now i will be uh, discussing about the that, that this mainly it is the practical session so i have just given the brief about the what are the gm crops and how we can proceed for the gm detection so far if you have any query you can ask then i will go to the practical part no question no questions ma'am okay fine ma'am uh, you yeah. continue yes okay so uh, first step as i have already told is the dna extraction and before dna extraction we receive the samples either seed or food products then we have to grind it with the uh, this in liquid nitrogen with the uh, pestle or motor or we can use the electric grinder for the grinding of the uh, seeds or product then after this we can uh, use the dna extraction methods and dna extraction methods they are of two types conventional method or column based method conventional me methods are uh, we use the uh, uh, this the c tab or sds these are these behave just like the detergent and they disrupt the cellular wall or cellular membrane contents and they release the nuclear contents into the buffer okay and in the column based methods we use, these are um, uh, these are available in the form of the commercial kits and these are also based on the conventional ctap based method or sds based method in this there are columns are provided by the uh, along with the kit where the purification can be done so here is the small clipping for the dna extraction procedure so first of all the sample is grind in the liquid and uh, liquid nitrogen with the help of pestle and motor and in the accreditation facility we use sap color coded uh, lab codes so as to avoid the contamination for example for in our homogenization room we are using blue colored codes and for dna extraction room we are using green color so the sample is crushed to the fine powder she is grinding the samples with the help of a grinder so based on the sample size we can select the uh, pestle and motor or electric grinder and this is the pass box after the grinding of the samples she has she is putting the samples in the pass box to avoid the contamination and from this is the another room for dna extraction here she is collecting the samples and now she will be proceeding for the dna extraction process so in gm testing we must focus about the to avoid the cross contamination she is doing the dna extraction with the help of the commercial kit so in this also she is adding the uh, 
extraction buffer in the uh, tissue followed by the purification step So, uh, sample preparation, yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I think she has. Okay, the sample pre preparation is the most critical step in the GM detection uh, because we have to ensure uh, the quality of the DNA sample because. Uh, if we can receive the sample, it, it is non-GM, so the results will be negative. So uh, to ensure the false negatives or false positives, we have to ensure the quality of the uh, sample, DNA sample. So how we can test the quality of the DNA sample? Like DNA concentration, it should be more than 40 nanograms. Why it should be more than 40 nanograms? Because they, are, uh, they may contain very small amount of genetically modified ingredient or GM content. So the quality, uh, so the concentration should be uh, a little bit on higher side so that we can detect small amounts of the GM also. And purity also, it should be acceptable within the range of 1.8 to 2, which is the standard limit. And we have to check whether the PCR inhibitors are present or not. So for this, we can uh, verify with the taxon or endogenous gene-specific PCR or real-time PCR so that we can ensure that the sample is amplifiable when subjected to PCR or real-time PCR-based test. And these uh, GM testing, it is generally carried out in the replications. Two to three replications can be done and from, from the right from the extra DNA extraction, we have we initiate the testing in a, in the replication. For uh, for example, for DNA extraction, we can use the two replications, and further each replication is subjected to PCR in three replications, and overall these six replications can be the tested for the one sample. So these are the results of the how we can check the quality of the DNA extracts and the like for, on running the DNA samples on 0.8% agarose gel, the DNA should be intact like this. And these are the how we can quantify the DNA like this is the quantification of the DNA using the spectrophotometer. And this is the ensuring the amplifiability of DNA, whether it is amplifiable to PCR so we have used, uh, we can use the plant specific markers also like which can target the chloroplast gene or uh, endogenous gene specific uh, markers also we can use. So these are the different uh, setup, uh, the, the conditions for the PCR, how like PCR it involves the denaturation step, then primer annealing step and extension step and this is the general composition of the PCR reaction. So this is a brief about the PCR analysis. So these are the thermal cyclers where the PCR is carried out. And after uh, running the PCR, the samples are analyzed on the agarose gel electrophoresis. And for uh, resolving the PCR products, 1.5 to 2% agarose gels are used. 
and these are the this is this was the result where the positive control was amplified and here the samples also they have got amplification Uh, any question about PCR based testing? Okay, now coming to the real time PCR. That in real time PCR we analyze the results uh, based on the fluorescence, and there are of two types of chemistries are used: cyber green chemistry and Tekman probe chemistry. in cyber green chemistry only the primer to a set of primers corresponding to a particular gm target is used whereas in probe chemistry we use the uh, tekman probe um, in combination with the forward and reverse primers so it is pro provides more specificity to this method real time pcr method and this is the composition of the pcr me method there is available a uh, cyber or tekman master mix which contains the fluorescence fluorescent dye and the probe is labeled with the fluorescent dye as well as quencher dye so the analysis is entirely based upon the fluorescence signals these are the fluorescence signals which can be analyzed at the time of running of the reaction and this is what about the ct value ct value that is the cycling threshold where the amplification of a particular uh, product starts like this is the ct value of this sample this is the ct of this sample and if we uh, get the fluorescence curve these are the fluorescence based amplification curve then the sample is gm and if there is no amplification the process is the sorry, sorry the sample is non gm uh, this is about the tekman based results and in cyber based results as we there is no particular probe is there we use a set of primers only so after amplification we confirm the uh, specificity of the products as in the form of melting curves like this melting curve they should be unique to the particular target this is the general uh, reaction mixture of the uh, this uh, real time pcr method for the uh, now using the tekman probes and this is the cycling profile like denaturation and here the uh, annealing and extension step is take is taking place at 60 degrees so this is the brief about the real time pcr So she is setting up the real time PCR. So each test it should contain a positive control, negative control. Like positive controls, she has shown that EPSPS. If we are testing for EPSPS gene, we should have the we should run the uh, positive control. and negative control negative control it may be the non gm uh, 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 non gm dna or it may contain the non template control that is the water instead of the any dna so it is essential to run always positive and negative uh, controls to ensure the uh, uh, to remove the chances of false positives and false negatives so before adding all the components we have to spin the this spin the tubes briefly then after that we have to add these so first we have to prepare the master mix which contains the cyber mix and primers or tekman mix or the probes and primers
so now she has prepared the master mix after the preparation of master mix the contents are spin and then she will uh, then uh, in the tubes in or in the pcr plate the dna uh, first after adding the master mix the dna samples are added and this is the real time pcr system then now the this real time pcr has been started so uh, any doubt or question from re, uh, this pcr and real time pcr okay so so now coming to the isothermal amplification that is the loop mediated isothermal amplification so in this as i have already mentioned that amplification is carried out at constant temperature like single temperature no separate denaturation or annealing steps are required and in this instead of tac polymerase dst polymer dna polymerase is uh, used which has the 5 prime to 3 prime polymerase activity but lacks 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity and this method has advantages over uh, the pcr that it is some simple rapid and single temperature is required and it can be used for on site detection and uh, he, he, in this case not uh, highly purified dna is required and in this instead of two primers like forward and reverse primer four uh, two pairs of primers that is the four primers are uh, used that is forward and uh, um, this backward or reverse primer and inner forward and inner reverse primer so this provides more specificity to this assay so this is the how the uh, lamp reaction can be carried out um, uh, there are two types of detection modes that is the visual lamp as well as the real time lamp visual lamp i have already told that we add the cyber green dye after the incubation is completed using the specific primers for a particular gm target if the sample turns green then it is gm or if it is it remains orange then the we can say the sample is non gm and this uh, reaction can be carried out in the simple heating block or a uh, dry bath also here uh, the thermal cycler or highly sophisticated uh, system sophisticated systems are not required and in real time lamp it can be carried out in a iso real time isothermal system which is portable with uh, power backup so it can be used for on site gmo testing and here also as in the real time pcr 
the detection is uh, analyzed in the form of the fluorescence based amplification curve so these are the reaction layout for example this uh, visual in visual lamp we add the buffer here we know call the thermopole buffer prime uh, these are the primers in, uh, along with the four set uh, four primers additionally the loop primers can also be used uh, which can bind to the hairpin loop like structure which is formed after the amplification with this Uh, forward uh, inner and outer primers and reverse primers so it provides the more specificity to the lamp uh, reaction and here the incubation can be carried either at 60 or uh, 60 to 68 degree temperature depending upon the gm target and this is the real time lamp it is the same as case of the real time pcr here the ready to use master mix is available so we can add the master mix and the primers in that reaction so she is setting up the uh, lamp reaction she is adding the buffer primers and all to prepare the master mix and all the components uh, they are uh, required to be uh, spin or mini centrifuge centrifuge for a uh, three uh, like uh, 15 to 30 seconds so she is doing incubation in thermal cycler Uh, we can use a heating block also so after the completion of reaction these are the lamp products so now she is adding the cyber green dye in the lamp product which is Uh, amplified so after the adding cyber green if the color turns green then we can say it is gm or it is a positive amplification is conducted so in this there is no green color formation so the amplification is not ma'am observed uh, ma'am excuse me ma'am yeah uh, dk payasi he is uh, he is raising hand actually okay okay dr uh, dk payasi if you have any doubt Yeah. No sir, no sir, no doubt sir. Okay. Actually, okay. I am in. Okay. Suddenly, it happened. Okay, okay, okay. okay. please. Yes, ma'am. Continue, ma'am. Yes. Okay, fine. So this is the real time uh, lamp instrument. after setting the up the reaction the amplification is carried out in this and this is the portable system 
the weight of this instrument is around 8 uh, sorry 2 kg and it is provided with the battery backup so we can use this on the field also so here also we can analyze the results in as amplification and melting profile so uh, any uh, like any question from these techniques which one is more accurate madam either loop or thermal one accurate yeah. actually yeah. if uh, accurate if we want to quantify the gm cons concentration okay okay then the real time pcr is best because in real time pcr we can do quant quantification but for screening only we can check whether the uh, gm uh, Uh, element is present or not we have not to quantify then all the three methods are good like pcr real time pcr and uh, this lamp also and uh, this is all based upon the expertise and availability of the resources in a particular lab okay okay ma'am madam yeah. whatever for screening purpose all the three are good and uh, for quantification purpose real time pcr is uh, uh, used and uh, along with real time pcr digital droplet pcr is also a technique which is being used in uh, other countries also for uh, gmo quantification and what is the major difference between real time pcr and digital droplet pcr in real time pcr we have to run a um, set of known standards okay then we have to compare the gm content whereas in the digital droplet pcr uh, Uh, we can and uh, there is no reference set or reference material is required for the gm quantification but the one time setup cost of digital droplet pcr is higher and expertise have more expertise is required for the running of digital droplet pcr okay okay madam uh, one more so whatever uh, the germplasm that you will import means whatever is imported that hmm. all will undergo on this gm testing or only? no no actually um, mainly if the some transgenic planting material or transgenic seed is imported for research purpose purpose okay these are imported through rcgm review committee on genetic manipulation is the regulatory authority okay and uh, okay. the application is submitted to through the, them and then through nbpgr is the nodal agency to issue the import permit because after the quarantine processing and molecular testing the these transgenics are imported so we are these uh, this is mandatory to test the uh, imported transgenics but in some of the non transgenic consignments okay like that of mustard or uh, actually 2 3 years back we have tested the linseed flax seed accessions which have been imported from canada so uh, the uh, so uh, this is also imported uh, um, uh, in, uh, this is the non gm germplasm okay in, but imported from canada so we have tested for uh, confirming the non gm uh, status before planting to the uh, field experiments okay okay so for the selected samples like uh, we have uh, selected accessions from the gene bank we are doing the uh, checking the um, uh, non gm status or confirming the non gm uh, sample uh, non gm status like we have tested uh, uh, i will discuss in uh, later coming uh, coming slide okay this in detail so one more uh, one more query madam hmm? so for inter laboratory confirmation now uh, you are giving to some laboratories no they are also yeah like actually i want to know can you give me a brief background of yourself myself uh, dr bharati working as assistant professor uh, in department of seed science and technology pg okay okay fine uh, madam uh, for hmm. uh, this inter laboratory testing no actually your laboratory is only accredited for gm testing for inter laboratory testing you are sending for some other laboratories so they are also accredited for uh, testing actually uh, the, the labs are accredited for proficiency testing pt providers proficiency proficiency testing providers 
okay for example uh, this export inspection council under government sector it is accredited for providing the proficiency testing and some of the labs private labs are also accredited for the providing the uh, proficiency testing okay okay so these are similar to the inter lab comparison programs but analysis of the results of the participating uh, laboratories is a little bit different from, from this uh, in proficiency testing okay hello madam yeah hello yeah yeah uh, madam uh, any dna isolation technique for uh, based on ncm based sds based ncm based dna isolation technique used for uh, ncm based ncm nitrocellulose membrane okay nitrocellulose membrane okay so this is not dna extraction technique actually the uh, this is the hybridization based method gm detection okay no no madam if we, yeah. if you take gm crop uh, mm -hmm. uh, supernatant and export the nitrocellular membrane or take supernatant and bloated this ncm membrane further uh, ncm membrane were cut by kangaroo punch then use uh, use for 20 microliter uh, slideable distilled water and heat soak 80 degree centigrade for 10 minutes then use as a, as a dna in uh, um, ngm crop no no we are not using actually for gm testing we require the uh, uh, high quality dna okay right we right. should be free from any type of inhibitors right but right okay so yeah. we are generally preferring the column based methods uh, where the purification is also very uh, 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 critical and uh, maybe concentration may be low but uh, purity we have we have we, we have to ensure the purity of that sample for gm testing okay and gm testing also used for elisa technique for elisa technique used for gm yeah, testing yeah yeah elisa can also be done i think dr celia have told about something about elisa and uh, yes sir yes ma'am yeah yes, sir. this elisa and uh, this uh, dipstick method immunostick method immunostick method is very uh, quick and good method for the gmo screening actually i am here focusing about dna based method otherwise this is generally we can use the antibody coated strips okay just like the uh, this uh, diabetes testing strips uh, or pregnancy uh, testing strips these are, there are gmo testing strips are also available we just dip it and you have used the uh, this covid testing strips also so just we have to dip in the sample okay right. first we have to grind the sample in in the buffer provided with the immuno strips and then we have to add the dipstick in that sample and uh, if the uh, two lines are formed then the sample is gm that is one control line and one gm line okay okay madam so this is the very fast method and some commercial kits which are based on the immuno strips are available so we are also using for if you have we have to first initially we have we, we are receiving some suspected sample so in uh, within 15 minutes we can analyze whether it is uh, gm or not and then further we can do the confirmatory test and similarly elisa can also be used for the gm uh, gm detection but the uh, limit uh, main limit uh, limit is uh, when uh, uh, as these are targeting the protein if the protein is denatured so and in dna dna based methods these are targeting the dna which is stable at different temperature or this so we can um, use the dna based methods for process products also okay for okay. seeds both the methods can be used thank you madam thank you madam thank you very much yeah. so uh, actually this is the mainly the training on pgr management so what is the use of the gm diagnostics in pgr management and for unauthorized gm detection so first is the uh, as you all are now aware about the different lectures have been conducted so there is national gene bank at npgr which is conserving more than 4 lakh accessions of different agri horticultural crops so we have to ensure gm free conservation of germplasm in national gene bank so we check the adventitious presence of transgenes in some of the selected samples 
or the selected crops i will uh, um, discuss about the how selection can be done uh, in um, for the checking the adventitious presence of the genes in the gene banks and also conserving agrobiodiversity how checking the unauthorized gm events in diversity rich pockets for example like in bangladesh i have mentioned that the bt brinjal has been commercialized and this uh, uh, bangladesh has the porous borders with the eastern states in india so we have to check we have to or we have also conducted some studies that we collected the brinjal samples from the eastern states in our country and check whether the there is unauthorized presence of gm or not a gm brinjal or not was there so these gm detection methods can be used for the by the testing laboratories also there are a large network of the private sector laboratories also and there are four national referral laboratories in our country so each each and uh, these labs are involved in the gm testing and we have also transferred the technologies to dss uh, this image tech private limited and where some of the uh, kits they have been commercialized as we have some of the technologies they have already in market in the form of the gm detection kits which can target 35s promoter nos terminator or fmg promoter and uh, these are uh, these diagnostics these are also a uh, tool to test the gm seeds import, imported for the research purposes that is we have to ensure a particular transgenic which has been imported it must contain the transgenes or events which are claimed by the uh, source of import and these are also provide as i told that lamp for these immuno strips they can be used as on site detection tools at the uh, in the farmers field or at the port of entry like uh, at the sea ports or airports also the seeds are imported bulk of seeds are imported like uh, in india uh, papaya or these we are receiving papaya consignments and soya bean consignments which are imported as non gm we are receiving these samples also for the gmo testing so this is about the monitoring the adventitious presence of transgenes in gene bank accessions and what is the selection criteria from the gene bank we can uh, check the uh, states where the field trials of a particular gm crop has been conducted or nearby areas we select or the year of the uh, field trials so we generally target the states or year where when the sample has been entered to the gene bank and the particular crop so far we have tested the accessions from mustard maize brinjal okra and cotton so this is as i have already uh, told that uh, this is the nodal agency and bpgr is the nodal agency for checking the import of transgenic uh, planting material so we are doing the molecular testing uh, for the uh, imported transgenics to ensure this terminator gene technology and this is the positive control to check whether the uh, uh, pcr run or the analysis has been carried out properly and we have all so we have to ensure the particular transgenic elements which have been claimed by the inventor or source of the import so we have to ensure these events also in the imported sample so we are also providing the gmo testing services so as i have i have already told that uh, some uh, flax seed accessions uh, they are imported from uh, this plant gene resources of canada and there is only one uh, event gm flax variety which was approved in canada way back in uh, 1990s but it was uh, uh, the uh, um, again it was restricted in that country also for the uh, authorization but the uh, but the unauthorized presence of this event was found in the imported consignments from canada to uh, europe so this uh, when we received these samples so the source uh, source country or source institute they told us to uh, where to first verify these accessions for 
non gm status and then we have then we have to use for the experimental material and these are uh, these are material was imported by ndtgr itself from the uh, germ plasm evaluation division and we found all the samples were non gm for this particular event similarly there was the report of the unauthorized presence of bt brinjal we tested the brinjal sample sorry gm brinjal we tested the gm samples uh, which uh, from the uh, which were uh, which we received from the haryana and the samples were found gm and it was also reported in news also so uh, in uh, uh, in the la yeah, last year as per the instructions re received from the ministry of environment and forest uh, that to we have collected we visited the Mahara we visited maharashtra where there were the news reports of the uh, uh, this uh, growing growing the non -G, uh, sorry growing gm brinjal in some parts of the maharashtra so we explored that region and we collected about 100 samples from different 14 villages of uh, this ahmednagar district and uh, this is the small matrix for the brinjal events we selected the targets for testing and then uh, based on these tests we found the non uh, all the samples non gm then we submitted this report to ministry also so this is about the food products Uh, globally more than uh, 20, uh, 24 gm food crops have been approved these are the 22 because uh, cotton and for maize we have developed separate gmo matrix so we have developed the matrix for 130 G gm events uh, for 22 gm food crops and then we selected these targets for which can allow the screening for all these 130 gm events and these uh, assays or uh, multiplex pcr assays or uh, sing single pcr assays for these targets we are using for the gmo testing of the uh, food products which are purchased from the market so uh, all of these uh, 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 techniques uh, can be employed if we know the the information of a particular transgenic construct or gm crop okay but what will be the what will happen if we the information of a particular gm variety is not available so how we can design the primers from the known sequence so in that case this is the next generation sequencing is the is being employed and uh, there is a portable nano pore sequencing device also which can be used for the uh, detection of the gm crops which uh, or uh, unauthorized gm varieties where the information of the sequence is not available so this is the uh, nano pore sequencing device it is just like the a uh, stapler or pe uh, the size of this um, mini stapler and it is provided with the flow cell so this is in general a sequencing mini sequencing device where amplification of a particular pcr product with the suspected promoters or terminators can be sequenced so in this the sample can be loaded and then it is attached to the computer system which contains the analysis software so this is the software for the analysis of the sequence 
data which is generated from the nanopore sequencing device okay so th this is the main challenge in the gm detection when the sequence information is not av available or there is very low level presence of a particular gm or availability of reference material or positive controls these are not available so in that case is the uh, uh, this uh, possibility of next generation sequencing can be explored okay so uh, Uh, there is a few uh, now there are a few questions you can uh, reply also uh, this is the first question whether test for 35s promoter and nos terminator is sufficient to verify whether the sample is gm or not anybody can tell now actually those promoter region and terminator in between the gene is present or not we don't know madam that's why we have to test target gene no so these are not sufficient right yes yes yeah because some of the uh, transgenic crops they may contain fmv promoter or opilin synthase terminator okay so different promoters or terminator combinations may be present so uh, we have to test for more promoters and terminators also so can you tell what is gm event anybody it is having uh, the external gene madam that is yeah external gene like uh, external gene but the there should be unique flanking site a okay, unique integration site okay like if we add cry1 ac gene in a cotton it may be inserted at site a site b or site c if uh, the cry1 ac gene is integrated at site a in two to three transgenic lines so this comes under same event okay if it is inserted at uh, site a and b then these are the two different events okay clear now uh, clear madam okay for gm quantification which method is useful real time yeah real time what <laughs> real time pcr yeah and if the sample does not have 35s promoter but there is amplification of nos terminator whether the sample is gm or not if promoter is not there uh, it cannot be expressed no ma'am no uh, we tested a sample for 35s promoter and nos terminator but uh, there was no amplification of 35s promoter but there is amplification of nos terminator whether the sample is gm or not the yeah the sample may be gm because the, in, uh, these are the constitutive promoter like 35s promoter sometimes we in some cases there may be tissue specific promoters like in golden rice the beta carotene gene it has to be expressed in the particular tissue so in some of the cases there are the uh, tissue specific promoters are inserted so then in that case cases the 35s promoter may not be present but nos terminator may be present so it may be gm okay further verification test need to be conducted okay then how do you proceed for gene specific test if you receive a packet of wheat flour from country a and in country a roundup ready transgenic wheat is approved which gene then you have to be tested 
roundup ready gene ah uh, roundup ready gene with gene bar gene madam it's a uh, uh, eps ps gene okay 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 then if you want to develop a gm crop say b at your institute whose permission is required to initiate the experience experiments which regular which authority if you want to initiate the experiments on the development of a gm crop which authority you have to inform the first in the flow chart first you have given no madam first one second one is for field trial set that uh, which authority okay i will uh, give the options uh, whether review committee committee of genetic manipulation or uh, uh, ibsc institution institutional biosafety committee ibsc uh, second one yeah institutional biosafety committee yeah yeah it's institutional biosafety committee okay if you want to conduct anything related to the gmos first you have to inform at the or discuss this at the institutional biosafety committee and uh, then further if you want to conduct the field trials of the transgenic event b that uh, regulatory that one is you know madam for the then first one which one first one it's a first one first engineering one. appraisal committee okay gec yeah gec gec yeah gec under ministry of environment and forest yes okay. yeah so here i am just touching the brief about the genome editing plants okay here uh, there is uh, the small edits or mutations can be carried out okay and there are the three different types of gene genome edited plants that is the based on the site directed nucleases that is sdn1 sdn2 and sdn3 in sdn1 and 2 there are the mutation of the few or one base pairs and as per the recent guidelines for safety assessment of genome edited plants 2022 uh, uh, issued by department of biotechnology these sdn1 and sdn2 plants these are exempted uh, from the regulation under rule 20 of rules 1989 which are controlling the regulation of the gmos okay so there is uh, the detection protocol for these are not uh, need to be developed or not required as a, as a part of the regulatory rule okay uh, only for the confirmation of these uh, mutations or edits the gene edit uh, genome editing detection is required whereas in sdn3 there is the insertion of foreign gene so in that cases the detection of gene these sdn3 types gene edited plants they can be carried out in the same manner as that of the gm crops okay Madam, so here i like to acknowledge or i like to thank the organizers for giving the opportunity to interact with the participants uh, and also i would like to thank for icr and director icr and dpgr for providing the facilities for carried out uh, carrying out the gm detection uh, research work and gm testing uh, work and uh, also i would like to th thank dr gurinder ji prandhawa she is former head of division of genomic resources and uh, in charge uh, this uh, G, uh, former in charge gm detection research facility and i would also thank staff who is uh, actively involved in the maintaining maintaining and assisting and research of at the iso iec 17025 accredited gm detection research facility and also this facility has been uh, since last 20 years there are these uh, this has been set up by different funding support that is from dbt barak and other funding agencies and also i i, I thank for you all uh, i would like to thank all the participants for patient hearing and also now you feel free to discuss if you have any query or question and uh, sdn3 is approved madam SDN3. Yeah. SDN3 that uh, genome edited uh, SDN. Yeah, this SDN3 is the genome edited where the foreign gene is inserted. Okay, yes, just sir. like the GM crops. Yes, sir. 
it is approved by the government am i no no it has not been approved oh that's one yeah. to the it is still under regulation only sdn1 and sdn2 uh there are uh, there is no regulation i mean like it is exempted from the rules 1989 yeah, actually there is the separate uh, there is full uh, set of the rules 1989 and there are uh, there is uh, rule 20 okay which has the different uh, sub, uh, rules uh, uh, which has been previously mentioned in that like import export or this uh, and uh, the developer of sdn1 and sdn2 they have to provide all the data they that these uh, um, genome edited lines they must carry the sdn1 like q or one base pair mutant mutant okay okay thank you very much madam very yeah. good presentation and uh, any dear uh, participants any doubts or queries please switch on video i think now it is the time and if you have time is there any chance uh, i am requesting you kindly visit the okay, gm you facility you can later also drop yes, a yes. mail to me if you have some query or all uh, yes. yeah and the gm facility lab uh, nbpcr is having a world class laboratory actually now it is earlier it is established by dr randava ma'am and yeah, now yeah. she is in charge monica madam is in charge it is a well maintained uh, full fledged laboratory Uh, like uh, our tissue culture tccu unit and national gene bank it is one of the best laboratory in bureau not only in bureau in india also it is okay. and any doubts uh, if you have queries you can post in chat box also or otherwise you can uh, uh, ask by email also okay ma'am i think no questions from audience okay. Yeah, yeah. and ma'am uh, let me i would like to thank you ma'am for a deeply elaborated uh, introduction and uh, the procedures of gm vote techniques and what are the rules and regulations in india that is uh, ma'am nicely you elaborated ma'am and practical also you showed uh, personally also we are very happy actually actually virtually it is very difficult to difficult, yes, yes, the uh, practical session yeah. actually pgr especially All experts are recommended. Uh, that means mm -hmm. uh, offline training is very good, ma'am, compared to uh, online programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks for listening, uh, uh, audience. Also, thanks to ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Very okay. highly informative lecture. And uh, thanks to audience also. Uh, now it is the time to leave the session. And uh, Monday morning we have we will. again we will start at that is 9:30 as usual regular and tomorrow is a holiday have a nice day and if you have any questions or presentation and morning also dr s r adu shared his presentation i will send you that is a, and uh, don't miss that uh, one actually okay thank you thank you one and all thank you very much thank you sir thank you thank you thank you Thank you sir thank you very much thank you very much sir Vijay Mandal ji recording start stop